Welcome to the Visual Cast. Coming at you from California, I'm your host, Alon Hammer, aka Rem. Episode lucky number seven is here, and we have an awesome guest on today, Tommy Etkin, aka Tekt. Beyond being an amazing VJ and a partner in a stellar, interactive, and immersive media studio, Tommy created the toolset known as Ray TK, an amazingly powerful toolset built in our favorite software, Touch Designer. In our sit-down convo, we get into what it was like working at Google, starting out playing with softwares like Max MSP and VVVVV, fulfilling the creative itch regardless of what's being created, making interactive and immersive art, and what got him into ray marching and starting a development project like Ray TK in the first place. After the set, we talk about dreadlocks, spirituality, and some idea on the future and maybe how we can make it better. For Tommy's set, we get introduced to Ray TK within Touch Designer, and we look at an amazing and beautiful interactive and immersive installation Tommy made for Mind Palace, an awesome exhibition done by Tommy's company, Immerse Studio. Tommy was a pleasure to talk to, he's a good friend, and I think we made a new length record on this one. Let's go. Please like and subscribe, share with anybody you think would like this convo and showcase, and without any further ado, here's the visual cast. At an amusement park, and it's fun for a while. Some people have been on the ride for a long time, and they begin to question is this real or is this just a ride? And other people have remembered, and they come back to us and they say, hey, don't worry, don't be afraid ever, because this is just a ride. human being um, and a staple to what it means to be doing open source and community-based projects. So welcome to the podcast, Tommy. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, hell yeah. And thanks for the nice intro. It's very flattering. I mean it. It's been, uh, I've really wanted to have you on for a while. I'm happy we managed to to manage to do it. Um, And this is actually a really good time to talk about uh, Ray TK April, or how do you, Ray TK Ray Ray April? Ray TK April. Ray TK April. Yeah. Ray TK April. Yeah. That's good. Um, it's a contest, correct? That uh, is, um, obviously, yeah. we're going to get into everything here, but just thought we should start it off with that. So go check out yeah. Ray TK April on Tommy's Instagram, linked below, uh, after you watch the podcast, of course. <laughs> Important. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of like um, the January challenge that a lot of people do for like the kind of generative art stuff, and just sort of trying to get encourage the encourage the community to kind of like try like, lots of different approaches to the same sorts of ideas, and been getting some pretty cool stuff so far. So oh, I look yeah. forward to seeing where it's super, going. Super nice stuff I've been seeing on the Instagram. Really, really awesome stuff. Yeah. All right, let's jump right in. So, Tommy, my friend, you have created interactive installations for massive brands. You've built shows for high-end musical acts, and you've been VJing for almost a decade, maybe more. I'm not sure about that. You are a real pioneer in the generative art scene. You not only develop a tool that democratizes coding and ray marching, but you support it extremely meticulously. You've created an absolutely beautiful community around it, and in so, having ushered in a whole new generation of visual artists and enabling them powers they could not have dreamed of before. So what is it like having created a tool that gives people such a powerful tool of creation? Yeah, it's um, seeing seeing like a, a whole community of artists doing stuff that kind of used to be off limits, um, just in terms of like the technical skill required to, to learn how to write shaders. It's been really, really satisfying um, and seeing like the the different, just the range of stuff that people come up with um, and ways to use these tools that like I never really thought of doing or, you know, seeing it in live performances or installations or like all these different kind of people just take this, this little like, you know, creative tool and then just run with it and, and make all kinds of stuff that yeah, it's uh, 
I mean, that's that's why I do it is 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 to see, you know, to see a bunch of people making things and being able to kind of like express themselves artistically and helping that happen and supporting that has been really satisfying. I can imagine. I can imagine there must be a really strong feeling, you know, just as from, you know, I've never really developed a tool for people to use as a community, but just as a, a creator myself, just making art and having people appreciate the art or being inspired by the art is a great feeling. I can imagine it is exponential when you're actually enabling people tools to make that art. Yeah, yeah. And that, like, just the, the different perspectives and different, you know, things that people bring to it is, like, right. just take, taking it to places that, like, I would never have gone on my own and like yeah it's it's that aspect of it has been really amazing i'm sure it must be so cool like just i remember um i, I think i even maybe met you or talked to you before i even knew about ray tk um and then i remember you, discovering yeah. ray T what was that you, you met me um before i started writing it i think okay yeah was it at Slightly. a Slightly, like right, right when you were starting it, I think, right? Yeah, yeah. I kind of um, remember our first conversation. It was in a touch meetup of some sort, and like you yeah. said something about ray marching, and I was like, okay, whatever, you know, like ray marching. I don't know what that is. Like, I can't. I know what yeah. it is, but not, you know, I'm not really doing anything with it. But I just remember um, it being released, and I remember kind of like downloading it and touch and playing with it and like instantly like messaging you and getting all your feedback and you know best ways to use it um and i i remember there was like a few moments of like you were like hmm it's not really the best way to do things but if it works that's great and i was like oh fuck this is like a good tool if, if the developer of the tool yeah. like is allowing or not allowing but is enabling me to like use the tool in a distinct and interesting way then that's like a really good developed tool, you know, that's, uh, makes it really powerful. I love that. That's the goal. So Tommy, I don't know. I don't, uh, we've met a few times. Um, we've actually performed together, uh, or adjacently, I guess, um, VJing. Yeah. Um, but I couldn't find much about you online and it was, uh, you're, you're actually the, one of the first that was difficult for me to find information. Um, so huh. good job with that. Um, staying yeah. off the grid, staying off the radar. Um, right. Where are you from? Um, so I'm from very around Boston. Um, yeah, so I grew up there, like spent a little bit of time in uh, New York, like around Albany and then um, headed to Boston a bit and then came out to, to LA and I've been here for about eight years now. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. And yeah. did you go to did you go to school um, for like like computer science or for art or yeah. anything like that? Yeah, so kind of both. Um, so it was I kind of went to went to Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute RPI. Um, that's why I ended up in New York, um, and that was kind of initially very focused on just straight computer science. Um, they also have what's called the MPAC or EMAC program with the MPAC center that was built later on, but they have like a, a kind of a pretty unique, like electronic art, um, department there that cool. is kind of weirdly separate from like the rest of the school. There's like very much, a engineering side and then like this weird little, you know, pocket of art, but yeah, so I, I kind of jumped into doing kind of both of those things um, pretty soon after I started there. Nice. Um, so although, you... yeah. Although? Although, um, so that the at that point, um, I was entirely, I didn't do anything visual. Um, I was entirely audio-based. Mm. Um, so it was a lot of, like, Max MSP stuff. Um, oh. And, you know. The OG. Yeah, I, I was using Max MSP before it was like really designed to run on Windows. Like they had this na like nasty hack that would like fake Mac OS in order to make it happy. Um, yeah, it was it was janky, but um, it was really cool being able to just like I did a lot of work with like sampling and delays and like just kind of different ways of processing sound. And I I was also making music at the time. Um, cool, which. 
yeah, I can't, I kind of like, I kind of came to terms eventually with the fact that I was more about making sound than music really. <laughs> right. But, um, yeah, so that was, but that also kind of like got me into live performance. And Ooh. so there was like a little open mic night there that I would, you know, every couple of weeks, like, you know, bring out my shitty little laptop and plug in and like make some weird, se weird sounds at people for, for a few minutes and then walk <laughs> off. Um, nice. Yeah. Like <laughs> some experimental, uh, uh, uh university yeah. days. <laughs> yeah. That's so, awesome. But it, yeah, it was nice. And I, like, I think I learned a lot there about, um, sort of the like ways that technology can interface with creativity. Right. And, um, I was studying under uh, Curtis Bond for a while, um, okay. and uh, he's a he's a audio artist that I think for a while was doing these kind of like generative pieces with um, paired with his his partner it was a, a a traditional Japanese dancer I believe. Oh, um, wow. So he would have all these like sensors wired up, all, you know, and getting this oh. like stream of data coming in, and he was playing sitar and like had all the yeah, mm. it was this whole super cool yeah early early really early neat. stuff. Yeah, and that was like that was back in like two thousand four or something like yeah. that, two thousand five. Yeah. Um, That's awesome. So yeah, it got me acquainted with like MIDI and kind of the like, you know, how to, how to fit technology into a performance. So were you so okay? So you went to school for computer science and then kind of sh shifted into a more art approach. Was um. Yeah. First of all, what was the catalyst to kind of shifting to a more art approach? And also, um, what made you interested in computer science? Have you always been like a nerd yeah. geek or was it kind of something, not that I, me as well, my friend, we're all nerd geeks here, but was it like um, yeah. something that sh like, you know, was it very obvious to you from a young age that you wanted to do computer science or was it something that just made no. sense to you? It's something I picked up, I think, during high school. Um and I, I can't remember what the original thing was, but I, I was making like, you know, web pages for, for, you know, back on like GeoCities or whatever it was. Oh yeah. Hell yeah. Um, GeoCities. Let's yeah. go. And, uh, yeah. So do, doing some like kind of, you know, graphic design-ish stuff for that and like Dude. then code to support that and Goodbye. that kind of like. Was GeoCities it, it, HTML? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was all. Was it, it was basically just like upload your your files, and they like shove a bunch of banner ads in the bottom. Uh -huh. and, right, right, right. Um, yeah, um, yeah. So, so that was like. So it just kind of clicked. Like it, it that process of like thinking about how to do something and breaking that down into individual steps and breaking each of those steps into in, into steps and kind of like thinking about how to do things, how to like uh, look at situations or, or, you know, pieces of information and like, mm -hmm. you know, split it apart, find the interesting parts. Um, and that, that just kind of clicked. Um, so that, and then, you know, I was getting to the end of high school and figuring I had to do something in college and then real, you know, kind of came through realization. Oh yeah. Computer science is like an actual, Thing I can go into um right. and yeah then then began you know five grueling years of of uh <laughs> at, of you know writing out algorithmic proofs and like all kind of the uh. so so I never actually like I didn't transition away from the com computer science I just kind of like uh -huh. added the art on top of that oh interesting um, yeah and that was something that I then like when I got out of school um you know i had this kind of like dual major degree one of which was like fun and the other which was like could get me a job um right. so i especially especially just, back then, i mean even now too but like computer science yeah. is like a super valuable degree to have yeah um, and it was like it was right at um like 2008 or 2009 um so like right when the the kind of economy crashed right. um the you know programming industry kept going pretty strong so yeah um yeah so i started working for like a educational publishing company doing like kind of online learning stuff oh, cool. um 
Yeah, it's, I mean, the, the like, and this kind of was a, was a theme throughout, like, my, my software development career of, like, the subject matter at hand was, like, I just, I had no interest in, like, I don't really care about, like, you know, certification programs for electrical right. line workers or, like, it's, like, <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't really matter like the thing that i care about is like building systems and you know it was uh yeah it was kind of like uh so, so that was kind of right at the like right after school i kind of transitioned like all of my focus into just writing code all the time mm -hmm. and there was i kind of dropped the art for for a while and um that was kind of where like where i stopped doing audio mm -hmm. um and but it was still like it's still a creative process it's still like you know coming up with you know novel ways of like presenting information or you know storing stuff or or kind of yeah. like you know solving problems yeah. yeah and so that was you know so that kept going for a while and then at some point um I moved to Boston and kept going with it and then um, got a job offer from Google and I uh, jumped on that as fast as I could. And, um, but between, so I, but uh, as part of the agreement when I signed, like it was, I made sure I had like a, a two or three month gap between the two jobs. And so it, so I had this like sudden burst of free time and which is like, easily one of the most productive periods of my life um yes. and kind of like during like right around then like um it was like 2011 or so um i picked up i i started playing with like uh vvvv um mm. which is and, having a resurgence now by the way i don't know if you saw i mean it's a, it's been going there. strong like yeah they they um they're actually one of the the kind of like equivalent to Ray TK for, for VVVV is, um, Fuse, which has been doing some really cool stuff. Nice. Um, it's a, it's by, a plugin developed by them or by somebody it's else? It's a, it's, it's like a, a separate studio. I think they got okay. some like financial backing from Rafik oh, wow. all and, and oh, stuff wow. like that. Yeah. yeah. They got, they got funding and a team. I did not. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, but so you, it's you were so getting I was into playing the with view. that. Yeah, and I and then I saw um the Amon Tobin Isam tour. Um right. which was like I mean maybe not like the first projection mapping, but definitely the first that I had seen and definitely the, the first that like the cubes, a lot of people had. The squares, yeah, right? it's like the huge guess, like big stage with all these yeah. cubes laid out yeah. and like we've talked about that on the show before. I think Velo uh Veracruz yeah. is part of that yep. as well. Yeah, it was a uh, yeah V squared Labs, Peter Sistrom, Labs. and right. fellow, and yeah, a bunch of other folks. Um, so I saw that and was just like instantly obsessed with it. I just spent all this time just like what like watching and rewatching the like you know people's shitty like hand camera film <laughs> of, of it from a concert and like. Um, and then there was some behind the scenes video that they put out where they were like interviewing Peter Sistrom or something, and there was like a screen in the background. And so I was like zooming in, trying to like find out like See what, what, what software that is. <laughs> and so I find I find out it's touch designer. I get really excited. I download it. I run it, and it immediately crashes. And like uh, it says that my graphics card isn't supported. Um, <laughs> oh no! <laughs> yeah. So I kind of like so I was like, all right, well, uh, yeah, I'll keep going with 4B. Like and just you know eventually like a few years later got like a new laptop and was like hey is... i wonder if this can run touch designer now and it could so that yeah. is so amazing like so you would have been four years ahead in your development of touch designer if yeah. only it would have run on a better gpu <laughs> yeah yeah it's a great but, anecdote i mean i think it was it was still useful to get that experience with um 4v or and just like <laughs> as a because it a lot of the it kind of looks similar to like max msp but the actual right. way that like data flows through it is like really fundamentally different yeah um and touch designer is a lot more like 4v where you have this kind of like scene graph that is happening yeah. in frames and you know each each frame kind of like pulls all this data through and pulls out images at the end 
Whereas right. Max is just kind of like a bunch of little objects kind of sending messages to each uh, other. Right, right, right. Also, so, 4V, yeah. similar to Touch Designer, is like, I don't know much about it, but I have used it a few times. It's 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 a base level where like you have to build everything by yourself. And yeah. like building everything by yourself, you're learning the fundament. I mean, for you, maybe yep. it's a little bit different because you're coming from computer science. But for me, for instance, learning Touch Designer was learning scripting. You know, yes. it's obviously not a top-down script, but you're learning yeah. to add and multiply and divide, and you're learning to uh, do logic, and you're learning to do mm-hmm. different um, variables and callbacks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Whereas a lot of, oh, I shouldn't say a lot of, but but there are m- a, many node-based systems do not rely <laughs> on the idea of learning to script. They're more like, oh. Um, you know, here's a procedural like blueprints, for instance, in 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 Unreal. Yeah, there is a lot of elements of learning to script, but they have modules built for you. Notch is the same thing. Um, you know, whereas yeah. Touch Designer and VVV, you kind of have to like really fundamentally understand things about scripting and about visual scripting. Um, yeah, I think it's very powerful in that sense. Like, if you learn one, you're learning everything yeah you know what i mean yeah yeah there's a lot of a lot of concepts that just kind of flow between similar tools like that um and that was, that was something that like i think has always has tr- just traditionally been a huge barrier for entry for touch designer is like you can build yeah. anything but you got to build it yourself right. you and somewhere. that's been you know that, yeah. that they've been getting like a lot better about that over the last, you know, five, six years, something, something around there where like they've started building out the palette library of components. And right. there's now like, I mean, the community is much, much larger than it used to be. So you can, you can get by nowadays with just like plopping stuff down that you find <clears throat> on, online and like wiring it up and tweaking stuff. And um, I just, I did a, a my piece alongside a guy recently who made a like system in touch designer without knowing touch designer at all. Like he just used chat GPT to like ask questions and build out the whole thing, which somehow worked. Um, it well, still kind of amazes me, but yeah. And they're like, the results were awesome. And so it's become that like barrier for entry is lowering, um, but it started pretty high. Yeah, I think that you you really hit the nail on the head with um, the aspect of touch designer being uh, like a, a high barrier of entry, and now is kind of becoming a little bit more easier. Uh, the palette definitely makes a huge difference. The op snippets, mm-hmm. if anybody yep. doesn't know, there is every operator has six or seven, sometimes twenty examples of best mm-hmm. ways to use them. I even till this day open up the op snippets when I'm um, oh, yeah. stuck, and I think yeah, that the biggest, <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, I think everybody does because it's like you can use it in a hundred different ways, but then it's like wait, there's one mm-hmm. way specifically to use it properly, but I think that a huge a huge influx of touch designer being more um, uh, uh, approachable is definitely the community, um, yeah, and I think that that's like kind of re- really where touch designers besides for being an amazing software with amazing development, et cetera, where its main power lies in, in, is in the community. You know, there's a yes. lot of communities. There's Notch community. There's an Unreal community. There's Resolume community. There's so many different types of communities. To me, the Touch Designer help group is the most powerful resource of information for a software that's not provided by the software. And then if you add to yes. it, like the actual forums of the touch designer mm-hmm. forums, pretty much any question you have has been answered already. Um, you know, I, I, I kind of, it's similar to me to Blender, whereas I always tell people mm. Blender is such a good program to get into, not because it's such a great program, which it is, but not necessarily, but it's because if you have a question, it's been asked already and answered. Um, mm-hmm. And like cinema, maybe it's been around for enough time. You know, Houdini has a big community, but like you can't beat like the open source identity of like people like just frantically asking questions and then people that know the answers answering them um yeah and i think that's like really uh where touch designer excels um and also they have an amazing support team as well uh yes. even though i had um it's a small anecdote but 
I had an email uh, recently from, I'm not, I won't name who, but I was told to stop asking questions via the support email and ask my questions in the forum unless I want uh, my uh, pro hours to be used. And I was, yes. I was a little bit, it's like, I mean, to be fair, it's been 10 years, so they've only told me this now, so yeah. I guess it's okay. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, I think... I was, it, it was hurt. It hurt. It was to the heart. Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the forum, like, I, I, the only time that I don't use the forum is if I'm dealing with stuff that's, like, under NDA or right, right. Um, that I, like, can't be posting publicly. But, yeah, it, it's, I mean, yeah, there's support process is like is amazing um amazing. and the forums are amazing and like yeah it's it's a it's a it's a pretty common occurrence to the where i'm like coming up against some issue i'm like trying i start like typing it in on in a forum post and it pops up that you know thing next to it that's like five people have already posted about yeah. this and they have answers yeah. And, you know, the, the worst yeah. is the worst for me is when you type in a question and it's been answered like in 2008 and like yeah. the answer is like not it, it's relevant, but not really. And you kind of have yeah. to like yeah. now go yep. around in a circle to figure out how the answer is going to help you in this current situation. <laughs> I, I get the, I get the experience of searching for something and then I find myself posting about it like 10 <laughs> years ago and then not right. getting a response or something. <laughs> It's like it's the same problem ten years later. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, um, that's awesome. So your your introduction to touch was kind of out of almost like um, natural progression in your kind of yeah. art career. Um, you're you happen to also be an amazing painter. Um, was this kind of something that you always did, or was it something that you found later on? Um, and yeah, like what was what was your you know, you went from Google, from designing products to, or, or I should say from coding to kind of a much more generative art approach. Like what was really yeah. the crux of, uh, I, sorry, before you answer that, I want to just yeah. say one thing about what you said about creativity. Um, hmm. It's such a good point And I try to, I make it like every episode now because I realize how not count, not intuitive it is of a thought, but the idea that creativity is not only for creating art, that when you, uh, you know, approach a code or you approach systems engineering or you approach, you know, problem solving, the creative yeah. brain is active and very powerful, if not yes. as powerful, if not more powerful than when you're making art. And the, the feeling that for me personally, that I get when I finish a creative project uh, as an art piece is the same feeling that I get when I solve a coding problem or when I solve a yeah. systems problem. It's a very distinct feeling of completion and like a creative, like, you know, circles been closed. So, sorry, I just wanted to say that. But yeah, so for you, where was, where was like the very strong shift between systems, operation, engineering to yeah. generative art? Yeah, um, so I, I kind of... Um, I was working. I was working at Google up through twenty twenty two. I think. Um, so there was a really long stretch where I was, you know, going to work during the day, sitting in front of a computer writing code for Google, coming home, and then like sitting in front of another computer writing stuff for myself, and. Um, and I had also started picking up a lot of commercial work there. Uh, mostly in like architectural installation pieces. Mm -hmm. um, so I like answered a, a post on the touch forum, like uh, I, maybe a year after I moved to LA and there was like an architecture studio, Narduli studio, that's, you know, 15 minute walk from my apartment. And so I started working with them and that was uh, involved a lot of things like, um, you know, video panels on the side of mm. buildings or in hotel lobbies or, mm. you know, that that kind of thing. And there, it was a lot of like, you know, using weather data or something as like right, a right, right, right. source for that generative is. patterns or, yeah. Um, so I was kind of splitting my time between the sort of the two, the like software engineering world and the like software engineering, but art world <laughs> and it was 
um yeah it got to a point where i think the the time that i was putting into the like google stuff was i mean it i mean working there was like an incredibly positive experience like it was i mean every one of my coworkers was amazing like just reliably amazing and nice. you know the tools that you have to work with are like just massive and you get your you know you can like get your your stuff out in front of like five six hundred thousand people easily and you right. know you are clicking the button that i put there and <laughs> you know there's there's all there's a lot of cool stuff there but like the end result of it is a product that i you know don't really have any interest in and right. so i'd kind of been like Ever since I had that, even before I started Google, I had that period between the two jobs where like I had this creative boom. Mm -hmm. um, I was kind of like had in the back of my mind that I want to leave eventually and got to be 2022 or so. And I decided that it was just time. And so since then, it's been um, I kind of like stepped up a lot of the, the commercial touch designer work. Mm -hmm. um, and but also I'm, but at this point like a lot of the time is just going into ray tk development um and yeah so that's and it's something that like at the at the end of the day when i'm sitting there you know having spent hours working on something like i actually like the result and i care about the result now instead yeah. of it just being like a way for somebody else to earn money right or or a way for you to to yeah have a career or whatever it is yeah 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 that's powerful um you know because what what uh what were you doing at google just out of interest um so i started in flight search with which was a like very very deep back end um yeah it was it was uh wow. it was massive it was like on a, they acquired a company called ita that made this just like monstrosity of code that i that figured out like airfare prices and f and mm. found tickets and stuff and like it was just incomprehensibly like yeah just yeah just massive <laughs> and um i kind of when i moved out to la i switched over to doing like front-end development for mm. adwords um keyword planner specifically so it was like you know if you want to have an ad campaign for shoes then you want to like make sure your ad shows up when people search for like you know orange boots or something like right you know we we would like our tool be would be the thing that you figure out you know if i put in this much money a day then i'm likely get to get that. this many clicks and all that that's cool and yeah i mean it's it's fine like it was and it was a lot of interesting um a lot of interesting engineering problems also For a sure. lot of interesting like usability um you know user experience like design like ui, UI uh, issues kind of yeah because you know we we and we had like a, a set of really amazing like researchers that would work with us that would, you know, we were adding a new button to the screen, right? We want to, we would put it in front of people. Like, you know, you bring, bring in like customers and say like, all right, here, try using this and like talk us through your process as you're going. And you can see that like everybody just like skips over that button. The same well, thing. Right. It's like, that means it's not doing, it's, it's not right. useful. So like you kind of get this like feedback of like seeing people trying to use the things the that you're psychology making. psychology of like, it is wild. Huh? Yeah. It's wild. Yeah. It's like what, you know, when you, tr when you did this, what were you actually trying to accomplish right. or like, and right, like, right. did you think it would actually do that? So there, so there was like, there's a lot of interesting stuff to, to, to work on there. And um, yeah, but it just it didn't give me like a sense of kind of personal satisfaction so right. yeah yeah i and, think it makes sense especially if you have like an itch that's outside of you know we talked about creativity but it's almost like and you know please tell me you know if i'm if i'm on the button here but it's almost like an itch of okay, I'm doing something i'm getting the satisfaction of solving problems but it's not my problem it's somebody else's yeah. problem that yep. I'm solving and yep. I'm not like facilitating the needs and wants of my creative energy and brain. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and even, even when I'm doing, you know, projects for like a commercial client, like it's still generally like, I, 
I mean, I'll get some like artistic direction, but like it's still kind of my my creation or like, you know, even if even if, we're, you know, we're dealing with like, you know, just video playback, like there's still, you know, of content made by by like another animator, like it's still there's still all this processing, like what to play when and like, you know, is it you know, a weekday morning and it's sunny out, then we find, you know, then we pull out of some of these things and like, you yeah. know, it's, it's all, it's, a, it's, it's, all, it's the same kind of stuff that. For yeah. sure. For sure. And also, especially when you're performing or operating, you're yeah. very close to the outcome, you know? So it's, yes. um, yes. even if you're not doing That's... your own creative process, you're literally like the facilitation of the outcome. So you're already yep. like, kind of circumventing, okay, it's not my creative process, but I'm like facilitating it on such a close level to completion that it's like I am yeah. the creative process in a way. Yeah. And that's I, totally I mean feel that. Yeah, it's it's like I get to I get to see a result that, you know, changes right. when I change stuff. Like it's not yeah. uh you know, there's not like a three month, you know, For testing sure. process <laughs> and like yeah, all this yeah, especially when you're in a in a place like Google, like you can you can come up with like the me the best idea ever. Um, yeah. And this, I guess this is like in corporate world as well. I've had this happen to me so many times. But I feel like when you're in a machine like Google, it's probably going to happen more often than not. You come up with a great idea and like everybody loves it, and it's passed on to the top and top and top, and eventually it either gets completely stripped or changed or whatever. And it's like, okay, you you birthed an idea, but it didn't really come through. Um, and that's like kind of like, you know, working for clients, that's like just a common thing. But yeah, I feel like, yeah, I feel like if you're constantly dealing with that, it's probably very, you know, very, it, it, it hurts. It's, it, you know, you can take, I mean, yeah. I don't know about you, but I take these things very personally um, for sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. I had, to I had to learn to kind of like detach from some of that, like, you know, um, if, yeah, it, every, everyone there was really nice. And like, I, I never really had problems with people. It's just like, there are times when, even though something might be a good idea here, like it's part right. of this much larger thing that like, it doesn't fit with the other parts. So it's, it's a problem. Like, it's a problem. so you kind of have to be thinking about things on like a much, much larger scale. And your part of that is just like a tiny little, you know, Section a little, and, a yeah. little anecdote in the uh, yeah. code of, in the th thousands, tens of thousands of lines of code of, uh, of I mean, Google. billions, yeah, billions, yeah. yeah. I had I had the same um, feeling when I was making movies, of like, mm. the creative process is a very very long one. Like you can come up with an idea, write a script, and then it might be a year until you actually film, and then it might be even another year until you edit it. And there's like this very long process of like you're kind of in the creative process, you're in the idea of it, but you're not really getting any feedback until very later on. I mean, you're, you're yeah. getting feedback to what you're doing, but you're not getting an audience feedback. You're getting yeah. a, peer, a peer feedback or maybe a mentor feedback, but you're not getting like the actual end product result. Um, yep. So for me, visuals was like, oh, I can come up with an idea, make it, perform it within the course of, 24 hours, maybe yeah. less, um, was very rewarding. Very, very, very rewarding. So I totally, uh, uh, you know, relate to that. So, okay, so you, um, you know, you're in LA and you're kind of getting more and more into the uh, maybe, um, you know, generative art and kind of production, uh, you know, what, you said a really good thing before you said, um, uh, making v making code with art, or you said something really, you said a really nice uh, uh, thing. Yeah, <laughs> I art, like writing code, but but art. Oh, um, right, writing code but art. Thank you. Um, when did you start your uh, studio, Immerse Studio, and kind of yeah. was this a uh, was this like a natural progression for you? Did it just make sense to kind of you know go from freelance arting creation to having a little bit more of a support system? Yeah, it's um, it was a very like gradual. It kind of came into existence in a very gradual way. Like, um, I kind of I got I got started VJing because of um, 
mainly because of like a competition that somebody ran in um, Boston, like in 2014 or something. And um, so I met lots no of people way. through that. And yeah, it was, I mean, it was, it was awesome. Um, I so probably cool. want to get that started again. It's a really cool way to like bring out a bunch of kind of newer people in the, in the field and like For sure. see what they do. Um, but yeah, so, so that kind of like hooked me up with, uh, with a collection of people and um, one of them being uh, John McLeod or John Bunk. Um, and so he, he and I like started, you know, we, we hit it off pretty well and he's very like, he was I mean, from the beginning, he was very much like a kind of ideas, like idea person. And he kind you know, I, would, I used to like kind of la jokingly call it like bonk dreams big. Um, <laughs> he comes up with these, like, you know, you know, like what if there was like a, you know, we were surrounded by like whales that were like reflecting, you know, or yeah, like, uh, uh, you know, and I, I, I come in and I'm like, uh, okay, well, let's 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 taper that down. Like, let's let's go. Like, we can we can put a whale on that wall. We can put one over there. And like, I, you know, so so he, you know, he comes up with like the idea, the direction, and then like kind of the like artistic intent. And then I'm like, mm. how do I actually make that happen? Mm. And so he and I, and then a collection of other people in Boston started doing some kind of like public art commissions and. Uh, you know, small, small scale events. Um, and we did like a, uh, we did actually two, two events in like a rock climbing gym, um, outside of Boston that wow. we projection, we projection mapped like the entire climbing wall, um, mm -hmm. which was a challenge because those things are, you know, really curvy and, and, um, <laughs> Yeah, there was like there's we had to we did we had to use like a very early version of um like lidar scanning to try to get mm. like a model, but um so that kind of I mean at that point it was more like kind of an artist collective than like a right. studio, um and like we occasionally got money coming in, but like mostly it was just kind of like we worked together and make stuff, and that um I headed out to LA. Um, John followed me about a year afterwards mm -hmm. and, um, we started kind of picking up more, more commercial work and, uh, you know, doing kind of like production tech stuff and, um, you know, interactive pieces and, uh, that kind of, and then like live performances. Um, we did, we did like a minimal effort parties in LA for, for a couple of years. Nice. and minimal part effort of that, parties <laughs> yeah like which is that the turns out we're a ton of work <laughs> a ton of um, effort yeah a minimal effort yeah right Min High effort. there may be somebody that it was minimal effort for but it was not us <laughs> right. um so yeah but but i mean those they're they're fun they were like a good you know big big venue like to to perform in front of a whole bunch of people and mm -hmm. uh really good lineups and um but that was, and then kind of during that period, um, we we brought in Tim, uh, who is uh, another. I mean, he was in Boston for a bit before before, but I didn't know him at the time. But hmm. um, he came in and just kind of like was just helping out with stuff for a while, and then was doing some like content creation. He's like he has a background in like documentary film editing. Um, oh, well. So he knows a lot about camera work and like editing and like the you know bu building libraries of content and like all this right. all that kind of stuff, and stuff. so the the three of us kind of like coalesced and like you know the people that had been part of the the old older like artist collective that were like not really involved anymore just kind of like dropped off and it kind of boiled down to the three of us, and we at that point we were called Optexture Studio, um, and right around like late 2019 we kind of we decided that like just i mean partially for like financial reasons but also just like branding um to kind of re recreate ourselves as a merch studio nice. and so we you know got all that set up and then like two months later the pandemic hits and like uh, the industry shuts down um classic. so you know so there's a span where where it was kind of like scattered freelance gigs, but like run through through a, a group. Um, and so I was do I'm still doing a lot of the, like the architectural work. Um, so it's kind of processing that through through the studio. And 
we start we've been kind of shifting focus more onto event work and uh i think this this year is our our big focus is going to be on volumetric leds like specifically with um led pulse led pulse, um, which yeah. yeah which is super like, cool shit yeah, yeah it's it's amazing hardware like it's yeah. these you know three-dimensional grids of leds with like these just incredibly thin wires and which is like that was kind of like their their huge like just competitive advantage over like everything else in the industry is like just it's it's so much more pixel like relative to like empty space or wires like because you 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 know with a lot of these systems there's like a big thick you know wires going down that block the view of half the pixels and like they're you know so led pulse hardware is like just yeah it's like really high density and uh there's a really good rendering engine for it and uh it also like fits really well with ray tk um yep. so a lot of a lot of the like technology that goes into ray marching ends up being kind of really applicable to filling volumes of of leds with shapes mm -hmm. so so you guys are trying to so focus this, a lot on that Yes, yeah, so that's kind of going to be like our big thing for this year. Probably, I mean, probably more than just this year. But like, hell yeah, yeah, we're going into a huge R and D phase. It's going to be pretty amazing. Nice. Yeah, I must say the um, LED pulse. I had a chance to see it in person um, mm -hmm. in LA, maybe like a year ago or so. Uh, yeah, and I was actually blown away. Like, you know, yeah. volumetric LEDs. Okay, you kind of got my interest. Maybe like, I, but seeing it. Like and the te yeah. the demo that was going on was Ray TK and also a connect mm -hmm. just a face. Yep. Just yeah. seeing the face big, even though your eye sees the individual pixels, because they're so dense and because they're like you said, there's like a really interesting way that they do the volume. Um, yeah. You're kind of suspended disbelief of like just yeah. holy shit, is that a hologram? Like what what's going on here? Um, I was super impressed. I think it's definitely you know, like the, the current phase of it is the future of what's going on right now. And I think that it will yeah. only get better um, as time yeah. goes on. Super cool. Um, I want to move on to Ray TK because that's what we are here for, Ray TK Pro. But nice. um, we kind of glossed over the fact that you're an extremely amazing painter. Um, oh, thank and you. I just wanted to ask you, like, when did that, when did that start? Uh, you know, yeah. do you still paint? Um, I mean, like, 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 come on, bro. Like, yeah. Come I mean, on. that's like, what? It's like, it's like, come on. That's amazing. So I, I, I always like would, uh, I did a lot of like drawing as a kid, um, but that didn't really carry through much. Um, yeah, there was, there was like a, uh, probably 20, 12 2013 kind of around the same time that i started getting into like visuals um it it kind of somebody brought a bunch of paint and you know and supplies to like a little like camping trip in vermont and like we you know had a yeah it was it was, it was a really fun experience kind of like sitting out in nature and like you know playing around with stuff and um that kind of just I, I kind of got the sort of, I don't know, the bug there and kept it <laughs> going. And like Hell yeah. these days it's like, I mean, it's kind of, it's what I do at the end of the day when I've spent too much time looking at computers. Um, <laughs> and which like, I mean, a lot, a really a lot of my day is like in front of a computer for one purpose or another. Of course. And so this is like kind of a way that I can just have a, a thing to do with my hands and like that's like a kind of relaxing like um sort of meditative process and i've been doing a lot of like it's always been a lot of kind of well some of it was just very like abstract blobs and stuff but ended up doing a lot of kind of generative processes but like done Physical. by me not yeah. by a computer like coming up with like kind of sets of rules that like mm. you know the lines always curve a little bit like that at the top and so you know so you just cool. make a whole lot of those and like that 
you know evolves into something or like I love it. yeah it's 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 really it's like it's i like i really enjoy the process of doing it the res end results are like nice and i often just kind of like uh um there's a shelf behind me just like stacked full of these things i kind of <laughs> just like keep tossing them on the stack and uh <laughs> nice but occasionally pull them out and show people but like Hell yeah nice. it's mostly I, about the process it's amazing and and uh what you were saying about doing it as a way to like almost decompress your brain and hands yeah i i need something like that i really yeah you we 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 forget because it's like my vocation and my enjoyment both involve like a screen, right? Yep. Like I like watching TV. I like making art, but I also yeah. work my whole life in front of a screen. Yep. And I forget how much my brain is like wired into that. And then obviously, you know, with the phones and everything. So it's like, even after all that, I'm still looking at a screen. Yep. Um, having some, having some sort of, uh, hobby or I mean in this case it's like a actual skill um, that involves that doesn't involve a screen is so critical I feel um, yeah I gotta find I used to do like horseback riding that was I mean it's not like with my hands specifically but it was like um, no. it was a it was a type of horseback riding that involved uh, it, it's called domo americano it's like um uh, Native American kind of way of <laughs> approaching horses where there's no <laughs> saddle and it's all about like uh, mirroring the horse's energy and then you kind of like almost can mind meld with a horse. Obviously, <laughs> I wasn't like amazing at it, but I did get to a point where I could like sit on a horse and like control it with my thoughts. I, you yeah. know, there's very small physical things I do with my legs and my yeah. thighs, but the most of it was like just imprinting in my mind go forward go forward you know and creating yeah. this like um intention with the horse uh hmm. and it was so useful because <coughs> like just being able to shut my brain like it wasn't shutting my brain up just being able to use my brain at a high level yeah. not on the computer like cleared my mind out in such a powerful way i, I yeah find i mean in some ways like i mean at least for me with painting like it is shutting down parts of parts of my mind like and it's it's something that is engaging enough that like I don't get bored, right. but not so engaging that I like get stressed Tired about it stressed, and like yeah. exhausted and yeah. yeah, for sure. It's interesting because yeah. like like computers really there's so like you could do so many different things on a computer that you could activate every part of your mind just by yeah. looking at a screen. Oh yeah. But, like your, 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 whatever is, you know, your, 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 um, uh, not your prefrontal cortex, but your like eyes, what is it called? Yeah. The ones that connect to your brain. The I forgot what it is. Optic is it the nerve. The optic nerve. The, visual yeah, the cortex, optic, yeah. The visual cortex is always active, right? So even yeah. if you're doing something that doesn't involve visual sensory thing, it's for, yeah. forced to be on. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're in that like a uh, blessing and a curse kind of situation with the screens. Yeah. All righty. So Ray TK, um, give me like a maybe a, you know um, elevator pitch of what it is and um, you know why. Like why Ray TK? Why did you want to develop it? Um, you know what was the driving force behind the development of Ray TK? Yeah. Um, so Ray TK is a way to build and use shaders within touch designer without having to like write the code yourself um that is kind of used there there are like a few different ways that you can use that um ray marching was the original that's where the name came from uh and but there's also like you can use it for 2, 2d video processing or image processing or like volumetric stuff or Mm -hmm. um, a few other things, but so it, it came into existence because I, I mean, I had been seeing like the stuff on shader toy and, um, even like further back, like demo scene stuff, which just blew my mind. Like how, how can you, like, there's no geometric model going in. It's right. just no... code. Like, right. how does that make a, you know, 
a like a triangle dan dancing blob <laughs> guy with like you know with like trees growing behind him and like um yeah i uh, is there's no point so like, right there's no, there's no points there's no like like it was built by somebody sitting there writing stuff like right. um yeah like it and so i was kind of blown away by that and had sort of been putting off like the process of learning about it um for for a while and just figuring that like eh, there's got to be like a lot of math involved that like i don't really understand and like i don't it's been a really long time since i've like taken like a linear algebra course or like <laughs> um yeah and like i know what vectors are but i don't really know much about what it means in various yeah equations and shit but um so it was kind of like i uh, so i encountered um i don't recall who the original uh somebody made a tutorial with like a type like ray marching and touch designer like writing out a shader um which i kind of followed along with and like made a few tweaks to and um and then I found uh, Patrick Lechner's um, TD Ray Marching Toolkit, and mm. it was I think I think it was kind of geared towards like education initially. Um, so it was very much about like making something that looks like Touch Designer, and like you have you know you're wiring up operators, they have little viewers in them that just like a regular Touch Designer operator. And mm -hmm. the result is like Ray March image coming mm -hmm. out of it. And so it was, so I kind of like started looking at that and playing with it, using it, and then looking at how it was built and going through and thinking like, you know, okay, well, yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of weird. Like why th there's, there's a better way to do that. And like right. started swapping out bits of it and like, use you know as i was like using it to create little scenes um so that that what, went on what was for, it like, called that thing that you were it was uh, a, playing with it was tv ray marching toolkit so it was like a, just a toolkit tool. that somebody made yeah so it was um it was up on uh but there it was, was there up like... on github and like the touch center community site um and so yeah it's like a bunch of a bunch of it was basically just like a project file that has a bunch of these components in Modules, it that you components. can wire up and, and yeah um very like a so very rudimentary of, version of of ray tk almost yeah i mean like the core the core concept of it was was there like you are connecting up chains of operators they're each kind of like adding a little bit of code and other stuff that gets kind of like built up the end and then right. run to produce images. Right. So the, the, I just like, because of my, I don't know, obsessive engineering tendencies, like I kept seeing <laughs> things and being like, that's, that's not how I would have done that. Like, right. uh, okay. But like, why is it named <laughs> like that? Like, you know, and just like all these things that like probably don't matter, but like it, it, <laughs> it got me to dig through it on like a deeper level um, mm -hmm. and start replacing parts of it and experimenting with it. And then it, and that was like probably February, March, uh, 2020. And so wow. like, right, right, right. As like uh, quarantine set in and all that, like, mm -hmm. I know I was sitting at home, like, experimenting with this stuff and so there was a period of like about eight or nine months where i was like just hacking away on like my own little forked variant of of patrick's work and at some point like thought like other people might want to use this um and i, I know and as part of that like you know what would it look like if i was to start if I was to build this like just from scratch, like how, like there are definitely things I would do differently. Like, and 
So I got started on that in like probably like November or something that year. And uh, a couple months after that, like end of end of 2020, early 2021, um, I put out like the first release of Ray TK. Hmm. And, you know, it was it, it was limited like it, 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 it could, you know, a lot of it's it's interesting to go back and like kind of compare like which what things were there and weren't there. Right. Um, the palette wasn't there initially. There was like this other thing for creating operators, but um, so yeah, it, it kind of like, I started, I, I kind of built it from the ground up with the purpose of being a like reusable thing that people can drop into a project, create some, a scene, and then like that scene can just run on its own, no dependencies on anything else, like just run and right, produce, like, you know, like scripts images. somewhere else. Not like or... like not having to like load, you know, like the scene only works if you have like the the yeah. toolkit loaded or like right. you know, it was With the right file that was something, structure or whatever. Yeah. That yeah. was something that like had been a huge ended up becoming like a huge issue in the the previous iteration was that like I was developing it but I was also making stuff with it at the same time. Right. So I was, so like I would go back to stuff that I had, you know, content that I created like a month before and like none of it works anymore. Cause like I changed all the stuff and <laughs> oh, no. I, you know, That's that was like, like yeah. And like, you know, if I, if I really, really wanted to, I could like go back in like the GitHub history and find like, get like a copy of the code at that time. But like that, I'm never going to do that. And yeah. So it was all so I so I put all a lot of, a lot of like kind of design effort early on like before I even started making anything into making it like very reusable and very yeah. like packaged and like it's not people that are using it shouldn't have to think about what's inside of it or like how it does what it does that much and so that was you know so there's like a you know release process where like I take all of the stuff that I that that, that define builds the toolkit and then like boil it down to like just one file that people can drop in and like that is and like I only release one of those when like I know that things are in a good state and like that version is something that will work for people and right. so there's like a pro there's like a yeah. development process and like a lot of right. this is coming from like my my software Feedback. engineering experience oh. yeah oh it will and yeah, and well, feedback came later. Um, later. But this this is just like I, I have all these processes for like how to develop, develop software that I've been trained to over the you know to do over the years. Right. And like you you know, you test everything, you you yeah. know, have a build process, you have all these like and so then you know, I start releasing these things, I make uh, a and then like after a little while i realized like nobody's gonna use this if they don't know how to how to use it and it's really right. not like i mean i try to make it intuitive but like you need some it's intuitive for you it's yeah, gonna like know, it's, yeah especially and before that's something, you get the feedback you know it's gonna be like a yeah. whole process of like what are people using it it's almost what you said before about the ui ux you know of getting people yep. in a room you think right. that the big button press me is gonna be the one but then they're like yeah why would i press that except now those people aren't i'm not in the room with them they're like right, right. off you know in <laughs> on another continent sitting in their bedroom like playing with stuff and like um so so i kind of like I, I i knocked out like a a you know, a round of like intro tutorials. Um, the like the quality on those ones is, was real bad. Uh, the like microphone I was using was just like the shitty thing built into like a webcam that like it, it was. I yeah, I, I pulled those down out of like, uh, yeah, eventually. But um, so, but like with that one out, like people people watched it and people started playing with it and making stuff and like. That's when, and then, like, then I started getting like actual feedback and like questions and like, how do I do this? And like, how do I do yeah. that? And like, why is this broken? Interest. And like, why? Yeah. Interest and like just creation. And, mm. um, you know, so, so I started, you know, I started kind of like fielding questions from people coming in and like trying to like help people. People send me files. I'll, you know, I was trying to fix stuff and send it back to them. And like that, um, and that was, and this was like right 
right in the, like the year before I left Google. So like, this mm. is all kind of in my free time at night. And like, wow. you know, I'd be getting like, you know, sitting at work, getting like, you know, Instagram messages about like, how do I make like a reflective thing that, you know, <laughs> right. like, and, and so and, I'm sitting there like what I want to be doing right now, I actually want to answer this question right now, but like I'm at work and I have to, you know, I can, I can deal with this in like six hours. And, um, so then, so then when I left, like, it was like, all of my time can go to that and which was great. And so it's been, you know, and so, and so that, and that period, I kind of started ramping up the tutorials and started up like the Patreon and, mm -hmm. um, just putting, and, and like my, I kind of refined the process for the tutorials a lot. Like it was, uh, the first ones were very much like, just kind of like I came up with the topic and then I started, I hit record and I started talking about it for a while. And then like, I stopped and put that up and like, right now it's like, it's like very, I, I proper I processes. Like, I make out like a script. I like oh, wow. build it twice. I build it like once just to see, to figure out what to build. I build it another time while I'm writing the script and then I build it a third time to record. Wow. And then I go back and edit and so much work. But all, huh? It, it is, but like it's people are like approachability is like a huge concern because this is it's complicated stuff. Like as much as like I can do, you know, I can do to like make it less scary is like that that's critical. And, right. you know, if, if there's if you, you see a video on YouTube and you're like, it's an hour and a half long, uh, yeah, I'll get around to that at some point. Like, right, 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 right. No, especially if it's, it's like, like a learning, a learning thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, it's, it's an like hour just... and a half long, and like, it's like you're just, you know, I'm going on tangents, and I'm like, talk, you know, just talking. It's like you need right. like cut to the point, like trim it down to like as you know, keep it like as coherent and like straightforward as possible, and like sure. that's how you get people to actually watch it and, and use it. It's like making it you know, making it approachable. Was it always a div a, like um, a community-based project? Was it always open source? Like, was that from the beginning you kind of had yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, in yeah, it's, it's well, it's still, um, it's open source in that, like, anyone can access the source and do right. whatever they feel like doing. Like, I, I think I have a, a MIT license on there for something, like, don't yeah. sell it. Um, right. but other than that, you know, um, I, I just mean in the sense of like that you release it to the community for free, yeah. Yeah. you know, you have a Patreon, but it's not like the Patreon's not like the download link. The Patreon's just like more information and yeah. even most of your tutorials, um, you know, you, you release at some point, uh, you know, uh, for the yeah. general public, definitely check out the Patreon, super awesome information. I've been a subscriber for a while. I think still, I hope. Um, yeah. But yeah, so um, yeah. definitely check it out. Super worth uh, huge, valuable information. But yeah, I mean, was it like, was that yeah. important to you? That was an important aspect well, of it? I mean, in, in because of like where it comes from, like it was, I mean, it started as somebody else's project, right? I'm not going to like true. turn around That's and sell true. it, right? And, right? and the demo a, scene and like Shader and Toy, like, all these things. All that yeah. stuff is I'm it's I'm using code from like I mean hundreds of people. Yeah. And so I can't I mean I I could I don't know. I, I would feel bad like trying to sell that as a commercial product. Yeah. Um so that's why I've kind of do I do you know, I use it in my own commercial work. Um I you do consulting work with it. Um and you know, I can do like if people need custom stuff built, like I can I can do that. Um, nice. And doing the you know tutorial like early access stuff for Patreon supporters and like you know I'll put out like content that I've been creating with it, like you know scene file downloads that people can play around with and like customize, do whatever they want. And nice. Um, but it's it's still it's very much like the goal is, for the toolkit itself is to like get people using it and making stuff like right it's it's not strictly an income source it's just like no. tied into my income sources well i would say that uh you know the having people using it and creating with it is an income you know it's not a dollar income but it's a yeah i mean spirit i, I would i would say it's a spiritual income of just like 
karma. You know, you're literally allowing people to use this thing in a way that they couldn't have done it before, like direct, directly associated or directly, um, yeah. you know, your, your development is directly integral to me being able to create. That's like a very karmic thing of just like creating this very beautiful circle. Um, so I, you know, I hope that it comes to you in a, in a good way because you deserve it. Um, yeah, let's jump in. I mean, I want to see what you got for us. Um, you know, uh, it's always a huge pleasure to uh, see how people use tools, especially the guy who made the tool. So <laughs> let's jump into it. Yes. Yeah. Um, so we can kind of do do a couple things. Like, I think it might make sense to just kind of like build a piece from scratch. Um, Definitely. So, and load up something new um so this is like so most of my most of my like content creation these days is i mean i i think i think of it as scenes like it's a uh, i have a i have like a little editing tool window thing where i have like a library of tox files that i work on um which has gotten a lot larger than i realized but um <laughs> Yeah, it's like four or five hundred at this point. Um, it's gotten a little, a little hard. It's you can get a little hard to find things, but, um, but so it's mostly like I come up with um, a lot of it is very like exploratory. Like mm -hmm. it's um, I don't start with or like a really clearly defined goal in mind. Like it's more just try things and see what comes out of it and uh, and go off of that i mean uh -huh. sometimes there's a goal but a lot of the time it's like it's very much like um experimentation mm -hmm. um so yeah so so everything often everything generally starts with like some kind of shape and usually like what comes out of this is like sort of abstract geometric forms um occasionally i try to go yeah, I mean like it's it's what the it's what the tool is is good at doing. It's what like I'm inclined to do. It's less like about excuse me. Um it's less about like, you know, super realistic environments or anything. Like there's right. if you want to do that, like use Unreal Engine, like that yeah. Um that exists. There's other yeah, there's other things for that, but so that so it's kind of like abstract geometric stuff is really kind of my my focus and i think where a lot of the like kind of motion graphic style stuff that people people take it um so usually just like starting with shapes and then you know trying sequences of, of different modifications on them um so just and... to just to reiterate we're actually so we're inside of touch designer um, yeah, I know we kind of spoke about it and I'm sure a lot of people already know what it is, but touch designer is the program that we're inside of and we're using a tool set of Ray TK. Um, that is a, I would say an add on, maybe a plugin, um, uh, not in the sense of the way it works, just in the sense of that it doesn't come with touch designer. You need to download yeah. it. Um, it's a very easy process to, in, to quote unquote, install it. It's really just drag and drop essentially. Um, and then if you open up the palette, just like you were doing before, that's kind of a, this is the uh, tool set of Ray TK that has all the operations that are involved and uh, come with it, which is kind of freaking mind blowing that you have more, <laughs> more operations in your tool set than actually comes with touch designer. <laughs> yeah. It's, just, um, it's amazing. I hit, I hit 399, um, uh, re like last week uh some of the some of those are like kind of unreleased or incomplete stuff but it's like it's right. high 300s um, oh yes sorry take it away yeah. continue. um so everything's you know everything in ray marching is kind of built around defining space defining shapes through like under under the hood it's like a bunch of a bunch of like math formulas mm -hmm. and there are lots of different ways that you can like modify space. And so, you know, there's, there's, you know, basic stuff like rotation, translation, all that. Um, then there's stuff like kind of mirroring or, uh, you know, doing multiple iterations. Yeah. And like combining, um, 
combining shapes different ways and like kind of transforming space in different ways. So, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of, it's been an interesting like shift of mindset from dealing with, um, more traditional approach and touch of like geometry based stuff where, mm -hmm. you know, it's not, uh, you're not modeling in the same, in the same sense. Like you can, mm -hmm. you can build up, you know, I mean, Inigo Quilez is like, is able to somehow use this to, to, I mean, not, not Ray TK, but like the underlying code that he, that he, he's the author of, um, to build like, you know, photorealistic snails and stuff. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not quite on that level. Um, Who but, is that? Uh, Inigo Quiles, um, Inigo Quiles, IQ. Um, so he's 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 basically he's the creator of Shader Toy. Um, oh, so he makes okay. like, yeah, just like amazing. Yeah, all all the, just writing out code. What um, the yeah, fuck? like that's re that's snail re marching. With, yeah, this is very marching. This is all like yeah, snail with like perfect you skin a, textures and subtle movement. You know, insane. and like. Beautiful. droplets Actually. of water it's yeah so it, and this is all just like you know hundreds of lines of code it's a good a good um, few hundred lines of code yeah which like he, he, and he actually he makes um he's made a few videos of uh his process and like it is i uh, i'm not exactly intuitive i would say uh -huh, um uh -huh. Specific for he this def massive brain. <laughs> yeah, it's like he he just kind of has like an innate sense of what how the different formulas behave and like right. how you know if you want to get two things to like blend into each other with like just the right amount of curvature between them, like how like you know yeah you use a sine wave and another you know and like that somehow produces like this like perfect you know shape and. um but I'm kind of more like experimentation um, mm -hmm. than abstraction, you know, playing with things. really. Yeah. And well, it's also, it's also like you said, like if you want to do that, there is tools for that. And obviously yeah. this guy is making, not making a point like to prove something, but he's like, this is his tool for doing that. Yeah. Which is super cool. Um, but yeah, I mean like, it's not, you know, that's not like a, a everyday's everyday ma everyday man's use case. <laughs> yeah, um, and like I, yeah, I think he's I think he's been working at Pixar or something. Like, oh wow, doing yeah, just like yeah. Um, a big thing but, about ray marching that we didn't mention is how fast it is. So yeah, you know, when you're looking at um a scene of whatever, let's say a hundred cubes, um, and a normal traditional rendering pipeline, let's say SOPs or just any kind of, uh, triangles and points and stuff, you have to render all those and maybe you're using iteration. So maybe you're only doing it once, but the GPU still has to process each one of these objects in a, some way. And in ray marching, correct me if I'm wrong, it's not really, it doesn't need to process every cube per se, right? It's almost like, yeah. Um, yeah, please explain it better than I can. So you can, so there, there's a whole category of things that you can do to space that are kind of like a simple, a really simple one is like reflection where you're kind of just like mirroring everything across one line. Mm -hmm. And so that is rather than like, taking parts of a shape and moving them it's just like when it's looking at coordinates in space it just if it's on one side of the line it flips it over and then everything that it would think of as being on the left is now on the right and right so it it's like just you're just dealing with like numbers and you can apply different transformations to them but things like infinite repetition are trivially cheap like mm -hmm. because there are you're not you're not doing the same work multiple times like all you're doing is just kind of like repeating space in a way because mm -hmm. it has to for every pixel it's got to like send a ray out into the scene and like do all these steps until it hits something and mm -hmm. um so it's already doing that work 
for every pixel, every frame. And repeating, you know, repeating things in one in one direction is like just a a one line of code as part of that that like you know takes your coordinates and kind of like wraps them around. Right. Um so you can have, you know, an infinite Ooh. series of things and they'll keep going like as far as you know you'll you'll eventually usually have like a maximum distance on the renderer for performance reasons but you can keep you can keep moving in you know a direction forever and you're never like it's never gonna be it's never gonna run out of stuff it's um, uh endless tunnel heaven yeah so that's <laughs> so, so there's like there's kinds of contents content that like really is well suited to it and that kind of like yeah like endless series of things you know is 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 one and one of the kind of core genres i guess of content with that um so i and then one of the things that that got to be was like a i don't know maybe a year ago or two year or two ago um edition was uh the like this editor tools menu right so I found myself doing all of these tasks like repeatedly, like, you know, I've made a, I've made a thing and now I want it to like move continuously in some speed in some direction. Right. That's mm -hmm. like, you know, you in touch designer, the kind of standard way of doing that is with like chops or channel operators where you're kind of like building out these channels of data and, and, uh, they produce a number and then that gets like applied to a, property of, of one of your op, of your components and so that i found myself doing that like repeatedly and so i decided to kind of automate some of that where you know uh adding these like little helper components for i just want to make you know i've got three parameters here i just want to make the shift parameter just go in one direction so now there's there's a little menu that you can pop up that will give you different actions that you can take on whatever it is that's selected. Right. And some of those are for like, I want to animate one of the parameters or I want to like, you know, convert this three dimensional thing into a 2d cross section, or I want to like, you know, yeah, it's, it's a different, different kind of like ways of speeding up the authoring pro process. And a lot of that is stuff that like, could maybe be built into touch designer um isn't well, really specific to ray tk some of it but yeah i was gonna say like if any you know for anybody that does make content in touch designer having um those processes as a you know as a two-click solution instead of having to remember yeah. the process i mean i can't even tell you how many hours i waste trying to make the same thing over and over and i'm like wait i did this already and it's like but how did i yeah. do it and then you're trying to remember and it's like um i mean smart people usually have like their palettes right they have their custom yeah. things that they just reuse over and over um so having that addition is is great for sure and it shouldn't be built into touch designer tommy because then we would never learn how to do it ourselves <laughs> Fair, yeah, you're like, fair. you're like, you're like, eh, fuck that. Yeah, I mean, I think there is, I think derivative is very, like, cautious about changing the kind of core of, of or adding so to, too. like, the core of Touch Designer. Yeah. Um, they're very, like, you know, that they, they add components that you can use, or they add new operators and stuff, but, like, just the, the network the editor itself, like, this, you know, the stuff that goes on in this window where you're wiring things up, right? Like that has barely changed in many years. Like they added yeah. comments recently. Um, so you can have little comment boxes. Yeah. Everyone is very excited about this. It's like it's one of those things that like people have been asking about for like a decade. But um, but so a lot of that kind of like automating common tasks is like not really something that they want to delve into. I think partially yeah. for like if they build it, they got to support it for right forever for future, and yeah. yeah um but there's you know uh uh daniel molnar um, function store oh, has been doing best. a lot of really cool stuff like super cool because I love daniel the um the touch designer interface large parts of it are built out of touch designer components so like all of the buttons and stuff at the top of the window are like 
touch designer components. And so he, he came up with these really clever ways of like inserting new buttons in there. And yeah, so it's makes it's your life like, a lot easier. Yeah. Um, might want to, might, I might want to coordinate with him at some point, see if we can like integrate some of their ATK stuff with that. Oh, that'd but, be awesome. Yeah. He's going to be on um, in, a, in a few weeks. He's, nice. Uh, yeah. A busy, a busy dude. Yes. Yes, he is. Um, yeah. So, uh, one of the, one of the other like kind of key concepts in, uh, in Ray TK is like this idea of fields. So you can, we can just go back down to like one simple thing, right? And we can even pop off that. Okay. So we've got, you know, a shape that's moving around and we want to apply some rotation to it, right? So we've got, we can even just slow it down. Um, so we've got the shape here. We want to like rotate it, right? So what happens so we can use what's called a field to rotate it by like a different amount in different places. So you, mm -hmm. you know, you use a sine wave to make it like rotate by a little bit over here, a little bit more above that, and then go back down and so on. That's how you get this kind of like wavy twisty motion. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's kind of a different, it's a way to, it's another way you're kind of like placing behaviors in space and then having stuff interact with those. So this is mm -hmm. like, applying rotation you know different amounts of it at different points along the axis and then you're kind of like shoving a a, a box through the through that and like the result is a twisty box Copy. um and that's one of those that's one of the things that i think was not part of the original um ray marching toolkit that was like a more that was one of the the things i added as part of that uh early development process mm -hmm. but yeah. Um, so it's 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 just been it's been kind of interesting coming from like a coming from a more traditional touch designer background and trying to like adapt my mind to working with this very different set of capabilities. And I mean, I think that's kind of one of the big you know selling points of of Ray TK is like. There's stuff that is, you know, hard or maybe impossible. I mean, maybe not impossible, but like extremely difficult in touch designer that is trivial to do with this. Like, there, you know, conversely, like there are things that are trivial to do in the rest of touch designer that are really hard to do in, in Ray TK, right. like right, right, texturing right. surfaces, like is really easy on a model you know you assign uvs the vertices you put a texture onto them and boom right but in ray marching like it's a very different thing because there are no vertices there are no points there are no it's all just there like is. chunks of math interacting with each other so you have to like you have to like teach it what the how how to define you know the uv coordinates so if you have a right. box you have to like tell it like okay, we're on, we're closest to this face of the box. And then we're kind of like, we got to like, look at where the corners are, look at that, figure out that. And like, that's, you know, that that's okay for a box, but for like, you know, a twisty fractal shape, like that just, <laughs> it's meaningless, you know? Yeah. So shape. yeah, it's like, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a different set of capabilities and that, um, that being able to kind of combine the two approaches, I think is, is, is something that like is, is possible. It's, um, I haven't done a tutorial about it recently, but like you can kind of compot do like depth space compositing. So you can have like mm -hmm. a model that's like in a scene, but then it's not, it's not going to like cast shadows on the, right. you know, the Ray TK stuff. So there's kind of like compromises that you got to make there, but um, you know, ray marching as like a concept is like all about kind of tricks to like tricks to do things more, you know, faster. And mm -hmm. one of the, one of the things that I find to be kind of, you know, frustrating is like you, you see something cool and shader toy, right? It looks perfect. And 
you know, but if you were to rotate it slightly, it would be total chaos, right? right? Because it's designed for like that specific arrangement of things right. like is, you know, it's like there is no back half of the, of the shape because right. it's, you're looking at it from the front. So why, why would that right. matter? Like, yeah, so it's like, like, it's not a, it's not a 3d scene. You have to kind of yeah. suspend the idea that this is, I mean, it is 3d we're seeing it and you can rotate yeah. a camera, but it's not a yeah. 3d scene in the traditional sense that you have a three dimensional yeah. object. It's like, like you said, it's almost, it, it's, it's almost view dependent, right? It's like, Kind of if you think about it from like a 3D perspective, it's like culling, right? Like yeah. whatever the camera sees is being rendered, whatever is not being seen is not being rendered, but it still exists. Yeah. And yeah. here it's like whatever's not being seen by the camera doesn't exist. It's almost like, yeah. you know, it's like it's a very strange thing to to wrap your head around, especially if you come from the world of uh, classic 3D. Um, yeah. But I think that your tool set allows a the the it kind of you don't have to have that part of your brain on you can kind of just like let it go and just be like okay this is how ray tk works i get it you know i have an object yeah. i modulate it i put it through the system i get into the render um and you kind of have tools that are a little bit akin to 3d uh processy like lights and cameras and things like that um to me that's where it was very uh you know powerful um, where it was like, I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I'm not creating in a three dimensional space like I normally would, but I'm, yeah. I'm, I, I'm enabled to do the things that I would want to do like a tunnel or like, you know, a yeah. shift of perspective of a camera or lighting and things like that. Yeah. Um, and that's, and that, that's one of the things that I think has been really useful about the kind of community aspect of it is like, you know, I, if, if I'm making stuff and I, I encounter some kind of like weird thing that I'm trying to do is like, I know that that's the thing that it would be useful, but like, that's only the stuff that I personally am inclined to do. Right. Like the kind of art that I'm likely to make is like not what other people are going to do necessarily. So getting a lot of those questions coming in about like, okay, but like, what, what this? you know, what can I have two lights? Right. No, why not? I think like, my biggest thing was yeah. reflections. I remember I was asking you tons about it and you're like, yeah, kind of, but it's expensive. And then, yeah. you know, and then you kind of just like, as the designer, you kind of have to think, okay, well, what am I trying to reflect? Is it just specular? Is it just like, you know, yeah. a general idea that this is metallic? Okay. I don't need reflections for that. I can just, you know, place my lights in a smart way or make my material in a smart way. And yeah. that kind of thinking is like, you might think it's limiting, but actually it's, 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 it's allowing you to think in a different way, which is going to automatically be opening. You know what I mean? It might feel limiting yeah. at the beginning, but it's going to allow you to think in a different way, which is, I think, very powerful. Um, I'd love to just let you kind of go and see what you come up with, you know, just like play around, maybe give us some anecdotes of what you're playing around with. Yeah. Um, so... Make art, Tommy. Jeez, <laughs> oh, like put me on the spot here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, right. That was, um, one of the one of the kind of interesting things about the during the pandemic was the um, the interactive immersive uh, championship um, yeah. that uh, Elbers and and a bunch of other folks and derivative ran, um, which was it was it was, it was fun. It was like um, I competed both years and then like did not really did not do well either year, which um, <laughs> kind of cemented for me that like uh, time crunch is like not <laughs> the best way for me to work. Um, but are you competitive? Yeah, it was, no, not no. at all. Like, yeah. So I always, I always yeah. lose competitions. I'm just not competitive enough. Yeah. I just like, I don't know. I mean, but but, it, but also like it wasn't really like uh, it was more just like show off the stuff you could do. Um, right. But yeah, one of them like you know the second year I um I I put all this time in. I was like I'm gonna like learn Unreal too because it wasn't just touch designer stuff. And like you know I'm gonna figure out I'm gonna learn how to do like part Niagara particles and stuff. And then like <laughs> we knew one of the rounds was gonna be you know based on data or something 
And so I get all, you know, I come up with all these ways to like visualize stuff. And then like, there was no data source and they were just like, pick something. And I'm like, I can use mouse movement. Uh, and like, yeah, just that, that, uh, I, I put all this effort into like figuring out what it was going to look like or like how to, how to make it behave and let, and like none of the effort into like, where am I getting data from? Um, which kind of tanked me in that one, but yeah, it was, uh, that, that, I mean, it was still, it was still a really good experience and they do I think awesome it stuff. was, I love it was, yeah. HQ. Yeah. It's, I mean, a lot of, a lot of people have gone through that, like their kind of education process and yeah. like come out and had really successful careers and like yeah. I think it um, produces a lot of good stuff yeah and like uh crystal Zhao was was like i think came out of that and it's now doing a lot of the like making a lot of their their educational content and mm. lots of people that like yeah you know, learn and it's more than it's more than just like technical stuff although they do have a lot yeah. of that there's also a lot of like how to operate as a business right. and how to yeah. like market business yourself as an artist and like yeah. all that kind of thing, which yeah, is something that uh, super I, I try to avoid thinking about, but yeah, it's super yeah. hard. Well, you're lucky you have it naturally, you know, inside I mean, of you in some way. Yeah. It, it's, it's kind of like the fact that this needs to be a business in some sense is not something <laughs> that really came natural to me. Like okay. I, it's something that, you know, much to the like consternation of, of, of my, my studio mates, um, you know, I, I'm like, somebody comes, comes at me with like a, you know, Hey, could we build a thing like this? And I'm like, yeah, it's great. Let's start doing it. Boom. And they're like, did you arrange an hourly rate yet? I'm like, no. <laughs> did you get them to sign an NDA? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm like, I, you know, I've been, I've gotten better over the years, but like, yeah, it was kind of a, uh, it was a learning process for sure. But yeah, I think, yeah. So yeah, tunnels are kind of one category of stuff that like, I don't know, I've done, I've done too many tunnels recently, so can just do some, uh, radial stuff. Maybe move the camera. Um, Let's see. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And th this is something that like, that tends to happen, um, especially with like my file naming process where I'll start out something that, I'm, and I'm like tunnel. And then like, I have 17 other tunnels. So this is tunnel 18. And then like, I'm playing with it and then it turns into this, which is like not even remotely tunnel like. Right. And so I kind of have to like, uh, finding things later can be a little bit of a challenge, but X, uh, X tunnel, uh, you know, post flower. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, it's something that like, I, um, I mean that, the, the engineering background has like really, really cemented into me the idea of doing things the right way. Um, uh -huh. You know, doing things in a really organized way, naming things accurately, like, you know, planning stuff, doing, you know, making sure that like, you know, if I wanted to like, but, but which can also be really limiting, like, you know, if I want to like add audio reactivity to this, like, well, I haven't, do I, have I built the audio reactivity system? Like, eh, kind of, but I don't really like it, but kind of, you know, as opposed to just like dropping some stuff in and seeing what happens. Like mm -hmm. it's kind of a, so I kind of have this, like these like two competing forces with me, within me of like be an engineer and like, you know, do everything the right way and plan it. And everything is a system to do a thing. It's not just a thing. It's a, you know, it's right. a, it's a set of tools to do the thing. And, right. you know, and then the other side, that's just like throw some stuff together and see what happens. And it's cool. Okay. And like, there's a certain amount of like, I really appreciate a lot of the touch designer artists that come from like more art space backgrounds that like, don't, they're not concerned with, you know, building an audio reactivity system. Like right. they're just making stuff and like it, you know, comes out looking really cool. And like, that's, that's all there is to it. And like, it's a, 
which I think for kind of for live perform for like smaller scale live performance and for like you know kind of like smaller scale stuff works really well. The the point where that gets to be kind of a problem is like when you're taking that and trying to like turn it into you know a long term installation. So like, mm. and that's you know so like all the architectural stuff like. We set that up and we hit play and it runs for like seven, 10 years right. with nobody <laughs> looking at it. Right. So like yeah, it, yeah. it has to do the right thing without anyone like watching it for years. And so. Well, hopefully somebody's taking... watching it. No, no, literally. No, no, no I mean like, like, I mean like the oh, yeah, watching the end result. Yeah. <laughs> but, but an interesting thing that like that, that kind of happens that, that I, I picked up on after like a number of years of doing those is that like, you know, say you do like a hotel lobby, right? So, yep. you know, you're there while they're like, they're like building the lobby and you're like, you know, setting up wiring stuff and like plugging in. And they're there for like a few months, like tuning stuff. But then at some point, like, you know, the like hotel manager that was there during that process, like goes to another, you know, leaves that job and then somebody else comes in. And then at some point, like you've replaced all the people that know what Originally. That, that screen does. And right. like, they don't even, at, the, at that point, they're like, huh, it's like, it's like one of the panels is like flashing. Like, who do we call about that? Like, and they gotta like, look, you know, search through all this stuff to like find, vendor, you know, find the right vendor. Yeah. That's and really like, funny. And they call yeah. you and you're like, who are you? <laughs> yeah right i'm like i don't, I don't know what that is yeah, uh, i haven't heard really about funny. that yeah um but i don't know it's 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 just a it's a very different mindset than just like pure creation yeah and yeah but i think there is still there's a lot of creativity in it it's just like you have to be more focused and controlled in how you organize it yeah for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's see where this is going. I mean, if you maybe add some, yeah, feel free to. Uh, suggest. Well, we definitely want to get some 4D in there for sure. Don't uh, don't right. skimp out on us. Come on, Tommy, and um, yeah. uh. Maybe as uh, at the end, we could jump into one of your projects and just kind of look at yeah. the flow of how you, um, you know, from beginning to end, kind of a, uh, ooh, I love that. I love the 4D rotation. I wish I could add that to like, as like a post-process effect to anything. Yeah. <laughs> you know what right. I mean? Like, just like everything could have a 4D rotation in it. <laughs> like yeah. no matter what you're making. Oh, that would be so sick. Yeah. I mean, you yeah, kind it's... of have it with the, um, there's the, you know, the, a lot of people use this 360, a camera like a rectangular mm. camera as like a yeah. way to uh it's almost like a inside out kaleidoscope but it's um yeah it's not it's not as cool as the 4d rotation yeah the 4d thing was uh was a good addition it's like a very good like uh flashy surprise thing to drop in the yeah. middle of like a presentation about it and like yeah it's uh, it always gets a lot of like a lot of reaction it's like two lines of code that just <laughs> take a three dimension three numbers and produce four numbers out of it for coordinates and then go backwards and but and that's that's something that like i think i'm still i don't yet have a really intuitive sense of why the math behaves the way that it does hmm. um and just trust it yeah, like I trust and I've like I've seen, you know, I see I find something on Shader Toy and like it is doing the thing that I need to do. And I take, you know, I find the parts of it that are relevant and I kind of like uh, adapt those. And but like why that results in a box turning itself inside out, I don't have like a really intuitive sense of. But I've been able well, to get you, pretty far without that yeah so you don't understand uh the fourth dimension tommy <laughs> yeah well not currently there have been currently. points where i've accessed that but i'm not currently <laughs> right. uh, not yeah. on a day to day you're saying <laughs> yeah hell yeah um, yeah i mean it's, it's also i think it's a little bit of a um it's probably the wrong word for it 
I think it's just, it's saying fourth dimension because it's like based on time, right? But technically, you're not really seeing that per se. I don't know. It's like a it's an interesting way of calling it. Yeah, I mean it. It is it is actual four dimensional coordinates and like, um, but it's not like intuitively. It's not like doing what I would imagine. I mean you know, what is imagine a four dimension, but like, right. have you ever seen those examples of like the, um, 40 cubes, yeah, you know, yeah. where they'll have like a cube inside of a cube and it's kind of, a yeah, the hypercube and the hypercube. Yeah. But that's like, yeah. that's not actually what it is. That's just like the way to understand it in three yeah. dimensions. Right. Like in, in, yeah. rea in reality, the four dimensional cube is like an endless, never ending yeah, we can. kind of, we can't comprehend it really. So it's yeah. like, bringing it into the 3d is is always like an interesting like thing because it's i think it's like almost like the eye of the beholder decides what it is going to be you know what i mean yeah it's like yeah subjective that's um so i got i got a little bit of the way as to like adding a whole 40 system um but because there's like a, there's a whole kind of field of of shader art that's like you're taking a four-dimensional shape formula whatever and you're basically like getting a three-dimensional shadow of that thing right or a three-dimensional like cross-section cross slice section. of it yeah um and uh yeah there's there's a somebody there's a, a game developer that just made um oh the non the released... non-equal the non-equal rendian game the vr one the uh there's one that's um 4d gulls 40 golf. Yeah, I've seen that. But there's yeah. I, I there's another one that's I mean, that's fucking crazy first of all, just yeah. like you know the, yeah. the idea of that. This is crazy. But there's another one called um non -e I can't pronounce it properly. Non Euclidean. Non Euclidean. Yeah. It's also like a non Euclidean puzzle game yeah. where you can jump yeah. between like 3D and 4D and like solve puzzles with it. And it's like yeah. You know, playing it, I'm sure, is really fun. But, like, developing that must be such a mind fuck of, like, what are yeah. you even developed? Like, what are you even doing, you know? Like, I mean, it's so crazy. Testing it. Like, testing it, test, right. Trying try to figure, What is it like, supposed to do? Like, I don't know. Right. It's like, <laughs> like, like, you know, even, I mean, that, that that's another it's another thing that, that can be a little bit of a challenge with Ray TK is, like, mm -hmm. um, one of the... One of the things that was part of Patrick Lechner's original component library was there was a little viewer in each operator, oh, which yeah. was cool, but there's an entire render chain to support every oh, operator, expensive. which right. got real costly if you had more yeah. than like three or four of them. Um, so I ended up dropping that and going with like a kind of pop-up window thing that you can... Um, oh, I didn't even know that. you could do that. Yeah, this. Um, so there, there's like a what the fuck tool. Is this new? This, no, this has been there for like forever. So um, like any operator, you can just jump into a 3D render. Well, of sort of. Um, okay, you're like reprojecting it or something. Plenty of them are like, you know, not uh, things that aren't sh surfaces or shapes, like. There, I mean, you can view a two-dimensional pattern. You can view like as an image, right? But, okay. um, but for you know something like uh, how would I how would I visualize what the like diffuse shading part of a material looks like? I mean, right. I guess you could have like test geometry or something. But actually, I have a I have a, a ticket in GitHub open for that, but the low priority. But <laughs> other things that are like um based on uh in your when you're doing those kind of like repetition things that we're talking about a little bit earlier there's a whole system for like mod so for like making the different repetitions behave differently so like mm -hmm. you know when you have the kaleidoscope you have you know if you want to like make the top one move up a little bit another one move down a little bit and like all those other you know yeah yeah nice um <laughs> and so the whole system for, for like each operator kind of like understanding the context in which it's being used. Oh, so like, interesting. you know, it's called, it's called variables. Um, so, but that, but that means that, well, 
when I have this box, right, that box is shows up in 12 different ways. Uh, which one of those did you want to look at? And that becomes a whole challenge or like, mm. you know, looking at if you have like a two dimensional cross section that you're extruding out into a 3D shape and you just want to look at the 2D cross section like, well, you got to figure out and it varies, you know, along the length of that, you got to like pick a point where it's, you know, cross section and, and so that so there's there's things that are like the operator itself doesn't like contain a shape. It just contains the sort of the logic and instructions that right. produce that shape, hmm. which is it's different in subtle ways. Yeah. But for just tr straightforward like SDFs, it's uh or shape, you know, which are how you define uh, shapes surfaces, um it's it's fairly good. Yeah. Hmm. I didn't know that so. that uh, inspect thing. Um, I didn't know that it existed. That's really awesome. Yeah, it's like it's, almost it's almost like a back end like renderer just to like visualize like debugging it's, almost or it basically just like has its own little render chain inside it and like copy it like looks at looks at the, the output whatever you selected and like hooks it into it, it its in. own little renderer with a with a camera that has a mouse interaction. Nice. Um, Mostly it's used for like debugging. So like right. when it's there are errors, like can find, find find the code that causing problems or look at the different mm -hmm. parameters or nice. all the different components involved. But yeah, it's, it's useful always, just it's, as a way to like mouse around. It's super awesome. It's always these little things that, that you miss that are like the gold, you know, like the op snippets yeah. that I was talking about before in Touch yeah. Designer. I, dude, I've been using Touch Designer for almost a decade. Oh yeah, just about a decade. I only found the op snippets like two years ago, or like very oh, shit. recently. Wow. Yeah, no, those are I, those are key. I know, I know, and I'm like, and when I found them, I'm like, fuck, like I could have saved myself hours, days yeah. of frustration, yeah. you know, just by like sh seeing the snippets, and I'm like, fuck, I can't believe I missed this, you know. It's yeah. like that's that's why I think sometimes like. You know, I don't subscribe to this for everything, but I think sometimes when you learn uh, things on in like a course, you know, like beginning yeah. to end, beginner, you get all these like little things. And like, yeah. I think that the flip side of that is like when you learn things on your own, you figure out things in a much more intuitive yeah. way for yourself, right? But there's like yeah. a give and take, I think, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, I definitely, the op snippets, don't don't miss out on them. Inspect, yeah. Ray TK, don't miss out on it. Yes. I um yeah so I, I actually there there is a collection of snippets for ATK too, um that gets included in each release. Um, yeah, I saw it's, that it's like a it's, it's a like, project, right? It's like a, it's like a zip file now with a bunch of tox toxes in it. It used to all be one big tox with like a menu to navigate and stuff, but the, the process of building that was like a like fifteen hours of like oh wow chugging away like um and so i was able to cut that down to like 20 minutes by like separating them into different files nice. um all right let's let's open up one of your favorite scenes um you know let's uh let's see into into your mind a little bit i want to see maybe uh the most complex or the most intricate um and let's just see like from beginning to end let's go through it yeah, let me pull up. Let me okay. So I'm looking looking through my giant directory of scenes here. Um, I also had some stuff that's not Ray TK, but I don't know if we want to keep the focus on Ray TK stuff. Uh, up to um, you. Totally up to you. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, let's see both. Let's jump into both. Why not? Yeah, we have some. No, let's, let's let's pull up. Um, all right. So this is. Uh, there we go. Okay. Um, so this is something that I did. We we had like a um, an event uh, called Memory Palace recent, uh, like back in December. Yes, I wanted to mention um, that. I'm sorry I didn't mention that. It's a uh, art exhibit. Um, super yeah. beautiful, super awesome. Lots of really cool people involved. Um, yeah. Please tell us more it about was, it. Yeah. So it was um, it was something that I had started like in 2016 or so um this is this is one of the few examples of things that i've made that like has a defined meaning to it 
Um, mostly what I, most of what I do is just like kind of aesthetically driven. It's not like there's not like a message. Um, this, this is one where there yeah. is. Um, so this is kind of based off of the, um, some experiences that I had where I watched, uh, I watched my father, um, have a portion of his brain removed and have, you know, this, this, and just the changes to, uh, because of cancer and mm. then watched him die. And that was something that like, just seeing the, like, the like severing of all of these bits of connection of like shared ex like experiences that have happened, like, you know, things that like he and I did together that like, mm. you know, when he's gone, that connection is severed. At some mm -hmm. point, I'm going to die too. That connection is severed. And then that, that shared experience, that memory just kind of poof. Dissipates. And so that was something that I was kind of like obsessing over for, for many years and came up with this sort of like way of visualizing. So we've got all these little shapes moving around. And Sorry, is that, is that, the, is that the word the name Memory Palace comes from? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow, that's so beautiful. I didn't know that. That's beautiful. Yeah. And it's, it's something, and um, the kind of interesting play with that was like the, you know, for me, it was this very like, kind of like, I don't know, kind of dim like thing about death and like the loss of meaning. Right. And, um, but by pop, I, I showed it to John, uh, my studio partner. And he was like, and he just latched on to the idea of like, yeah, but like, while those people are alive, they're drawn together by these shared experiences. Mm, this is how you have beautiful. connections. This is how you have society. This is how you have like all of that, you know, comes out. It's not just about the loss. It's about the creation too, totally. which, yeah, um, was, was a really critical element to this, the system. But, <laughs> um, so we kind of, so I've been building this, been made a few different versions of it, but. Uh, this one is based in touch designer the previous one was open frameworks, but, uh, so we had an event where we put this on in front of people and there was, you know, it was projection mapped around walls. And then we also included this whole like sensor system. So we had mm. these, uh, Bluetooth broadcasting wristbands oh, and man. a bunch of like wireless access points on the ceiling. And we're, so we were kind of like tracking people's movement through the space and then using that to like influence the behavior of the, the, the kind of simulation here. Sick. And yeah, it was, it was, it was interesting. The sensor part was like, it ended up being a whole, I mean, that, that would have, that should have been months of development too, but I uh, got started a little late on that part because I was focusing more on this, but mm -hmm. um, so this was Into like, yeah. No, no, please show us. I was just going to say um, about interaction that it's like, a, you know, it's always a difficult thing. It is. And like, you never know what it's going to, what the, you never know what the interaction is going to be. Yep. I had and a, you need to have the hardware. Like you need to have the hardware, yeah. a really good anecdote from an episode uh, with Eric Mincer. Um, whenever he does a commercial project that involves uh, interaction, he'll do like a small little party with the final product he'll remove all the branding and everything but he'll do a final yeah. and he'll yeah. bring people to just play with whatever it is yeah. that they're going to eventually uh um you know uh ship and see just just from like an initial thing so that you're not like seeing at the location itself i thought that's such yeah. a it's such a small but such oh, a yeah. genius idea you know um yeah. Yeah, I'm definitely. We never, we never think about those things, you know, because we're so focused right. on like, it's gotta be good, it's gonna be amazing, it's good, and then you, you know, you don't even think about how people are gonna interact with it because everybody's yep. so different. Yeah, yeah, it was a, uh, that was definitely a, a, a big kind of learning experience, especially dealing with like hardware that we had not a ton of experience with, but, um, yeah, and we kind of. So we had that whole like tracking system. We also set up like a LIDAR um, on two of right. the walls. So you could kind of like push Touch things them. around. People responded to that way more than like all the parts that took, you know, For months sure. and months of development, but, <laughs> yeah, like which, is, which is fine. Like, yeah, it's like, I don't know. You, you never quite know what people are going to focus on until it's in front of them and they're, you're For watching sure. them use it. But yeah, so this, this is like, this is kind of the, 
larger scale projects layout that I tend to use where, where like there, everything is kind of like built up, split out into these different subsystems. And for this one, um, there was originally a plant that it was going to be split across three different uh, computers. Render There's going to be one. Yeah. Well, so one was render, one was like compute, and then the other one was ah, sensor. Oh, cool. um, we ended up combining the compute and the, and the the render into the same same project. So that's what like all the stuff in here is like defining and generating the contents of the scene. All the stuff in here is like turning it into image. Um, but and so the, hence the like million different connections between the two. <laughs> um, so the nice. simulation is like this. So this this kind of big network of stuff where you have this kind of core simulation that's kind of track that's like keeping track of all these little we, I call them observer objects or people mm -hmm. little mm -hmm. nodes and then like experiences or or occurrences um so it's kind of managing this collection of those and having the like you know establishing connections between them and so there's right. like a big there's a big chunk of C++ that's hidden behind this like chop operator with one one meaningless channel in it but all the data is kind of like <laughs> uh, elsewhere okay. um but then there's like lots of different operators is the c plus plus inside uh inside of touch or you made yeah. it you made a custom operator yeah so that so this is like a this is a custom operator the, you know memory to simulation chop um and then there are a bunch of other c plus plus operators that look that pull other kinds pull of data out of it so all the the position of all the, the little people objects and like how how long they've been alive, how much lifespan they have left, all that right. all that kind of stuff. How many all, Sorry, the, all Tommy, the different connections? These, these tops yeah. are C plus plus as well. So the, yeah, so these are. Oh, I didn't know you could are. make C plus plus tops. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Yeah. Obviously, because you need to have like a way to like uh, see the information that you're coding in in some way. Yeah. So it so it's kind of I it started with everything in chops and then transitioned to tops uh so that I could pull a lot of the logic into shaders. So uh -huh. um like a all almost of the, like a performance thing. Yeah, oh absolutely yeah, absolutely. Because you're dealing you know, if you're dealing with like even even just like a thousand, two thousand objects like that starts to way down when it's all being done in like one one operation you know one after another like you know Lines. as one shop does its thing yeah, for sure so so there's there's like all the logic involved in it of like you know what's where are the things there's also like forces that move push things around that like mm. keep them moving in different ways that like they kind of like attract and repel each other um is it all a that void kind simulation it's similar it's like a similar, similar. kind of behavioral rules like simulation. attraction because boys is essentially just attraction and rep repellation repel I it's a it it's i think attraction observation based so like you see it like each each yeah. thing like has a Sees range of view and it like view, see yeah. yeah yeah how many how, like whichever where the birds are within it like yeah. influences its choice of direction sure. there, so there's stuff similar? that is you know it's what, kind it, of similar it reminds like, me yeah. almost of um what is it called the uh, not the game of life, but um, yeah, the game of yeah. life. Connors, yeah. whatever that guy's yeah. called, Connor Conway, or something. Conway. Yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah. It, those just like as I'm looking at it more, it's not that, but it has like that just initial well, thing of like concepts, this yeah. very uh, organic moving uh, math. Yeah, um, yeah. There's, I mean, it's kind of it's like the where is it? Uh, I don't know, like behavioral simulation. I forget the behavioral name for it. Um, but uh, emergent systems and thing. Um, so there's kind of all the, so there's all these like forces to get things moving. And so that gets kind of sh sh shunted out into all these shaders that figures out like for every, uh, every pair of operators of like oh. objects, right? There's like a, there's like a graph of like, an, you know, Rows, rows are one kind of thing. Columns are another kind of thing. And then each okay. dot is like, a, are those connected to each other? And then you figure out like all the different forces that get applied to each object, and that gets fed back into the simulation that moves them. And so there's all the, all this kind of like logic and and different behavioral rules kind of like stacking up on each other to produce mm -hmm. like what goes on in the in the simulation. 
and then a whole other set of stuff that takes in, you know, the all the different objects positions and all the different, mm -hmm. you know, things and, and does um, mostly like instance based Iteration. geometry instances. Yeah. So, you know, nice. picking picking different colors, picking the right location, like scaling things that, you know, based on their their how old they are or something like that. All those little like kind of visual elements. Um, and then. Oh, careful. Uh, it's going to be hard to get out of that one. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I still, existence. <laughs> I still don't know like a good aside from just like what uh, I that's it. Just that's did, the only yeah. way to do it. Yeah. Oh, there is a like you it, can do like a F or not F, but like focus on a node, and sometimes it jumps back. Uh, it doesn't always it doesn't always work if you're if yeah. you have the node active. Yeah, it's one of, it's one of those weird little like touch designer or network editor quirks that yeah. probably isn't going to change anytime soon. No, <laughs> no. Um, but yeah, so, so this is like, and then you know so that, that's all just like the appearance of it then there's like a whole interface section which is like this whole panel there's like mm -hmm. a web interface that i could oh, wow. um walk Talk around the it. event like pull up my phone and just kind of like make it do things hell yeah um and you yeah the power. like projection mapping portions a lot of like coming up with like data about the state of the simulation to broadcast elsewhere. Cause we had these like panels that were showing how many of each color and the different, different things oh, like that. So it's, it's, this is kind of like, and it's just, this, this whole approach is like very much what I also do for like long-term installation pieces where you're kind of like right. breaking down everything that needs to happen into areas. And then you define how those areas interact with each other. And then you, make each one you implement what goes on inside each one so that it behaves the right way with the others and i mean it's, which is like how software development is done right yes i, I was and, just gonna say subsystems yeah. is not only a way to make things look clean and tidy it's also yep. a way for the computer to access information in a more um not necessarily cheaper but a more organized way so yeah. it's not just like one big thing that's just running all the time you have different systems that are being interacting yep. with other ones it also for development like you were saying makes your life easier and also when you bring somebody along to the project that's a developer yes. as well like okay you're only working on the ui just focus on that subsystem yep. don't don't look at anything yep. else here um so this th first of all this is amazing thank you so much for sharing this with us um like so you're like on a very you're on a very high level of development like you do c++ and you have a computer science uh, uh degree and everything so you know uh you know uh of course but what is like the like why would you use touch designer here i mean i kind of know the answer but i'm just interested yeah. to see like like if you can just code it all in C++ and you can probably find, you know, on GitHub some visualizers yeah. and et cetera, et cetera. Like why why use Touch Designer at that point? Why not just make it as a standalone app? I mean, that, that's, that's a good question. Um, so I think with that project in particular, like there, I did actually implement it entirely in C++. The very like earliest version of it was Open Frameworks, um, which was good for the like uh simulation logic how the different things like floating around do how they behave what they how they interact with each other um but then like if i wanted to have like hook up like a midi controller then i gotta like uh you have to find, find the, the midi library thing. integrate right. that in and then i gotta like if i want to have like osc to do a thing and then i have to like find a way to integrate like a whole osc system into it and then i have to like do if I want to do instance rendering, then I have to figure out how that works and like you know generate all the OpenGL stuff and like it, right. it's it ends up being like there, there's like all the the core part and it ended up still being C plus plus, but like everything around it was was using Touch Designer's abilities to like mm -hmm. you know if I if I want to I want to see a graph of like how many things there are like. I just have a chop. Boom. Right. That's it. Or a dot, right. I don't have to or... like build my own graph system or find somebody's right. graph system and integrate it in and feed it the right kind of data and formats. And like, it's, it's just, yeah, it's like a touch designer. I mean, I think is 
it's an environment. It's not like, I mean, I guess it is like a, an app or tool program, whatever, but like mostly it's like an environment for building mm -hmm. things. Yeah. And you can build, you know, apps in it, like mm -hmm. out of, like out of it. But, you know, the thing that like it really shines on is like all of the stuff that it, all of the elements that it provides for you to use while building out of the box, you know, wherever it is you're building. Right. Like, right. you know, I want to send, you know, I want to send my video to like a black magic IO card. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Dro drop in video device out done. Right. Like right. I want to, you know, now I want to like split, you know, split that image up into like four quadrants and rearrange mm -hmm. them like this and do that. Okay, great. Use yeah. a prop, Use yeah. the, you know, layout, do all these for different, sure you know, stuff that's just like built in that you can put your, your own custom, you know, special part, like kind of into the middle of this environment of all these other things. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I totally hear you. I, I, um, I'm very new to software development, but for me developing, if you're going to be developing or making something that involves um, let's call it video, let's call it um, input output of video of, let's yeah. call it texture, let's call it um, interaction with texture, then mm -hmm. having Touch Designer as your back end, as your environment, like you're saying, it's so powerful, not only because of the things that exist already, but imagine, so I had this thing with software like uh, input and output was very important to the software that I was developing. And if I would have, I don't know anything about C++, so I would have hired somebody to do it. But if I would have gotten somebody to do that, anytime Blackmagic updates their card, anytime a new output device comes out, yep. anytime a new protocol comes out, the amount of um, work that needs to be done to provide um, accurate and updates to those things yes. is extremely, extremely exponential. And the fact yep. that Touch Designer is kind of doing that for you Obviously, you know, you're paying for it, but it's it's being done as part of the software. It allows you to not have to focus on any of that input output BS and kind of remain yep. almost agnostic to that. Like you don't you really yep. it's like irrelevant. It's almost like irrelevant. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. MIDI OSC, uh Artnet, uh whatever, uh, you know, um uh web remote, like all that kind of stuff is just there. And if it changes yeah. and it updates, you don't have to worry about it because it's going to, you know, your your yeah. system is going to kind of go with it. Um, which is which is not to say that that uh, update compatibility is not an issue in Touch Designer. It, it, <laughs> it is, yeah, but it's less of an issue than it. It's you know, less of an much issue. less well, of an issue than it could be. For sure, and and the the problems that you're going to run into, you would have run into if you would have been running something standalone, maybe yeah. even more of an issue, right? Yeah. Um, what is it called that uh, when they have like a, a long-term support LTS? There's no LTS uh, versions, are there? Uh, there are. Of touch design. I mean, I, I think if you're dealing with derivative support, um, and you're like, especially if you're dealing with like pro license, like support hours and all that. Um, they will, um, they will maintain like a a fork a of a particular version and like make changes to it if you need like that i mean you're at that point you're like you're you're paying for that but yeah it's yeah. um there yeah. is some I, form I, of that yeah and that's that's like i i when they they added the ability to install multiple versions like in, right. parallel, in parallel um it was it was great uh, i also now have like 15 versions installed and <laughs> because it's you know, I want to pull up that, that memory project. Like yeah. there's like some, like, I haven't tested that in like the last, you know, six months worth of touch designer versions. Like maybe it doesn't work. Who knows? Right. And like, and, or if you're dealing with like a, a, a client installation, like they paid for a touch license in that... 2017, right? Like that capped out in 2018 so it's not like i am like i'm not just gonna if i need to like fix something i'm not gonna like ask them to buy another touch designer license right, update, update yeah, yeah you yeah, know yeah. just so that i can like change a you know a button uh, that's or something funny. that's funny yeah um that's awesome i would love to jump into one last uh ray tk thing um and then i would love to jump into some a little bit more esoteric questions for you um okay about things okay 
we'll get there in a second. Let's just see one more okay. Ray thing. <laughs> <joking>. Okay. <laughs> that was very cryptic. Uh, <laughs> Where were you on January 31st, 2003? Right? <laughs> yeah. Why Don't didn't ask. you respond to my email about collaborating? Ah. <laughs> ah. like, <laughs> yeah. I'm joking. You're actually very mm. responsive. Yeah. I try Not to like be. some other people. Mm. I'm joking. I'm joking. Yeah. I'm joking. Of course. Well, I mean, that's something that like, the, the the like Ray TK thing kind of like forced on me is like I if people are going to be able to use this thing and I do and like I care about people's ability to use this thing that means that like when they I gotta I gotta respond it's like you gotta respond and yeah. you know I'm sure that there will there will come a point where that's like too much um, and I you know I I can't but like right now I try to just respond you know within a reasonable amount of time to like everything that comes in yeah. and you know I've been able to maintain that so far you're very responsive I would say I mean compared to uh, endless software developers um, needing to respond to things you're yeah very responsive especially because it's well, a free that, tool you know like yeah. you're you're literally doing it out of your own time which is very powerful well, yeah, and that um that's something that um Keith Lestraco um with uh Luminosity yeah. um that he kind of like struggled with is like he made this amazing tool and then he releases it and then people start using it and then like they start hammering in with questions and then like, yeah. hey, I updated touch designer and this button looks weird now and why is yeah. this thing not working? And why and he like he it just he ended up I think kind of stepping away from it after after yeah, a while but it still exists somewhere yeah. i don't think it's been oh yeah it's out for there a while yeah but it's it's um, uh it's pretty awesome there's a new yeah it's not anything like it really it's um i mean it's just similar because it's a media server but uh anti-alias is yeah. um jack yeah. hurley's aavj kind of like yeah it's really not anything like luminosity but just in terms of like you well, know interfacing with media in a performance yeah. based aspect um yeah he really it feels nailed a it. similar role it feels a similar and role exactly and he yeah, nailed I, it because he just kind of used something that exists that people know so you're gonna have mm -hmm. a lot more familiarity with like how the ui works and the ux works um and he's also like i think to his to his, um, you know, first of all, uh, he's an amazing dude. I love him so much. But to his testament, like the way he released it in a very like scattered way where it's not like a wide release. It's almost like an invite. Yeah. It's almost like if you reach yeah. out to him, he'll give you a thing. You create a little bit more of um, like a testing ground where people are going to break it and use it in certain ways. And that way you're going to be able to uh, really be able to, um, you know, uh, debug it and um, yeah. be able to keep on top of it. Thank you so much for uh, showing us all that uh, back behind the scenes of your processes and uh, giving us a little bit of a Ray TK um, introduction. I highly, highly, highly recommend people to download Ray TK. There's no reason not to, even if you're not into ray marching, even if you're not into like visualization. It's just a really fun tool to use and it helps you kind of familiarize yourself with different aspects of 3D rendering that aren't mm -hmm. classic 3D rendering. Um, and Tommy has uh, uh, tens of, maybe hundreds of hours of tutorials and information. And as we mentioned, just reach out to him and he'll answer in his own time. So highly recommended. Um, and now is a great time because it's uh, Ray Tick April and yeah. um, we're getting lots of um, prompts. I'm just going to load this in here uh, we get lots of prompts uh, that tommy is releasing daily to kind of give you um, different ideas of things to do um, and the results are quite beautiful um, it's really yeah. nice to see i'm sure for you it must be great to see how people are reacting to the different i mean that's that's sick just yeah to try that. it's awesome yeah um, it's um yeah the, well just like the the wildly different interpretations of the same like core idea is really cool yeah, um i, mean, I kind of went back and forth on like whether in the in the kind of daily announcement post to like include some sample images or no, to like good. even like participate in it myself but i think i i, I kind of want to like step away and like not hint people too much in a particular direction and just sort of like put out you know 
a sentence of like inside, meaning like, you know, flip something inside out or like make it look like a place or make it look, you know, something yeah. and like see see where people come at. Somebody came for the place thing. Somebody made like a planet, which is like a totally different way of, of approaching that than I had thought of. Or um, yeah. Hell yeah. And yeah, so for, for there was one about text and somebody did like a cursive drawing thing. Nice. Um, do you yeah, have, it was, uh, it's, you have highlights for them? Yeah, I, I, I have it up oh, on my, uh, my screen. Yeah. Um, no, no, I'm so saying I, do I, you have, do you have highlights for the actual daily prompts? Uh, like on, um, not. Cause you, you should do that on the stories. It's like a, whatever on the stories yeah. you can well, you know how to do it. What I've been doing so far is just like putting out just basically like every, every tagged thing that I find, like, um, I, I repost in a story and I think as it, at the end, I'm going to like do a kind of compilation, um, of like, Best of you know, all of the different, different things for each day and like, yeah, all the different, yeah. So this is like, Ooh, what's that one? this is one of the ones, this was for the text prompt. And I was like thinking of like using, you know, use the text operator to make a word. Somebody interprets did... it as like a spline based person yeah, how does writing it thing. Even... It's so cool. I how don't do even sp... know. How do you get splines into Ray TK? It's just position. Uh, the position. poly spline SDF. Poly spline um, so, SDF. Jesus. So there is, there are spline <laughs> stuff in there. Um, I, I still don't quite understand how you would make this out of it, but somebody did. So can um, you, and then like, can you yeah. put in um, different SDF operation? Is there a custom F SDF operation? There for is. Yeah. Um, so techni there technically is. if I send it an SDF per se, then it should be able to. I mean, understand. well, okay. Send it in SDF. So there's like, there's an operator where you can like put in a chunk of code. Um, okay. I have a tutorial that's like maybe a year or two old um, that where like I find something on Shader Toy and I'm like, here's how to like turn this into a Ray TK operator. Right. Um, but there isn't yet like a good way to kind of like bake SDF data and into a form that it can use. Yeah. Um, that's going to be kind of one of the next uh, big areas of development is like I mean, Custom. one one thing that um is like uh is using um what's called volumetric ray marching which is like a, it's a slightly different process where um it's good for making like clouds or like things that are not um opaque okay. um and there have been a few people like mini uv and um oh, he's uh, coming on in a, in a week or yeah two. yosef pels and and yeah. um there have been a few folks that have been doing some like just really, really amazing stuff with that. And I think most of Ray TK should work with that. And I think it will also make it easier to take other kinds of spatial data, like a model, and Convert package it. it in a way that you could use in that kind of ray marching. Doing oh, that yeah, so in just like regular ray marching is like always like the number one thing that everybody requests is like, I have a model, can I import it? Like, not, not currently. Um, there, there is a there is an approach if you want to like run a bunch of Python machine learning models to generate codes like, but that's good luck. That's yeah, um, I I haven't even really gotten that working like reliably that much. But yeah, I'm sure it's just not you know you're gonna have varied results based on the topology yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Mini UV is awesome. Every time I look at yeah. every time I like as things pop up my in my Instagram, I'm just like, what the fuck? Like what? Yeah. And I always yeah. like I'm like, what? How do you how? How? And yeah. he's like, oh, it's yeah. just it's just it's just uh, particles. Um it's like point clouds. Right. I'm like, wh what? How like how is yeah. that? Yeah. I don't get it. Like, you know, like it's so yeah. smooth and beautiful. Like, how is it just point yeah. clouds? Like, what the F? Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. So Tommy, That's... um no, sorry. Oh no, go ahead. Yeah. Um, before we, you know, we're, we we've been running a while here, which is great. Um, but I want to uh, ask you a few uh, s s small questions about um, different things that we kind of po spoke about. Um, the first question is, and you know, if this is uncomfortable for you, please don't. You don't have to answer. But um, dreadlocks. Uh, you know, I have dreadlocks. Um, you have dreadlocks. We have dreadlocks. Yes. Um, yes. What does it mean? <laughs> what does it mean to you? Uh, you know, um, kind of, is there a spiritual thing behind it or is it more of a, you know, um, esoteric kind of, uh, visible, visible thing for you? Just, 
kind of an aesthetic thing. Like I have really, really curly hair naturally, and it kind of like turns into this giant. And so I kind of, I've at, at some point, I think when I was like, I don't know, 12 or 13 or something, like it's just like, this is the solution to that. And it stuck. So nice. you've yeah. had them for, you've had them since you were 12. Uh, I mean, there were a few points in between where things kind of had to reset, but Copy. Um, yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's always an interesting thing to uh, meet people with dreadlocks, you know, regardless yeah. of their culture or color. It's usually just like a, there's so many different varieties of the dreadlocks. Like when I came to America, obviously Bob Marley and like, you know, Rastafarianism is like a thing that everybody knows about. Sure. But yeah. I never saw dreadlocks as Rastafarian. I, I, I got them from like the Psytrance scene and people going to India and like, you know, yeah. interacting with Babas and, you know, these guys yeah. grow their hair. So it was very interesting to come to the States and like get that. I wouldn't say like, you know, negative, but sometimes eh, weird attitude. It can be for sure. Um, so it's just always interesting to, to see uh, the, the origin of those kind of things. Yeah. It's definitely yeah, a it's really, not- really easy way to have long hair. There's not much upkeep. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. I, I mean, right. I get mine. I get mine done once every two months. I barely wash them. Wow. You know, I wash them every, uh, you know, um, maybe I wash it once every two weeks. Maybe it depends okay. on the summer or the winter. But yeah. um, why well, you have a you have a, a regiment, a high a high end regiment? No, I mean, it's it's more. I just more maintain it myself and like kind of on an ongoing. It's like it's not a. Um, recurring scheduled thing it's just sort of like as i'm sitting there i you know fix things nice. um yeah yeah i love to get my um my roots like tightened you know and mm. wherever i'm living i always find like a, a a rasta person to do it for me um and now i have this guy his name is jagoon shout out jagoon the lion um he's also a reggae star but he's like this massive seven foot like fucking huge Rastafarian Brazilian dude. And he's just like, he's got like these thick, like, like this thick yeah. dreads, yes. like, you know, like 20 thick, thick yeah. dreads. Yeah. And, um, it's always such a great, you know, and he's like in the projects. So it's like always a super interesting experience to go there. And, um, I don't know, maybe like a year ago I had like, a real barbershop experience, you know, like, cause usually it's just me and him. And like, we get into like, you know, lots of topics like race, uh, you know, religion, like all these things, very open conversation. Yeah. Um, but it's just me and him and we have a rapport. So like, I'm very comfortable, but, uh, like a year ago or so I went there and there was like four other dudes there and I was like a little bit sheepish, you know, to like talk. I don't know. I, I, I just kind of, yeah. Felt a little bit like this is their vibe, you know, and I'm like introshing yeah. on there. But they were so yeah. cool and like open. Um, and the second I like did express myself, like the whole conversation shifted and it was like this super, I felt like I was in a movie, you know, like in some like, <laughs> you know, black uh, barbershop like talk, you know, it was so cool. Um, and I just felt very uh, welcome and it was just, like a really nice experience. Um Cool. Well, dreadlocks, I get it. I get it. You know, big fan, big fan. Um, So are you, uh, like, do you consider yourself a spiritual person in a sense? Are you, you know, do you view the world in that kind of eyes or is it more, um, are you more agnostic? No. I would say that the closest that I get to spirituality is, um, again, kind of like so many things in my life, like comes out of like software development in, in a weird way where um, I think the what we think of as like individual identity is sort of an abstract concept that we're applying onto like a system, right? So like, you know, my thumb gets cut off, like I'm still me. Is the thumb me? Like kind of. <laughs> Not really necessarily like, you know, if, you know, th- there are all those like philosophical questions of like, if you, if you know, if you one by one replace all your body parts, like, are you still the same person or something? But, um, so this, this idea of like identity of like the parts identity is like an abstract concept that we apply onto a bunch of physical matter. And that is 
and then like you, you can kind of layer those up of like you know a, a, a cell or like you know go down is like a, a cell is a collection of you know molecules and molecules are collections of atoms and like you go the other direction of like a person is like part of a society as part of a species as part of a mm -hmm. ecosystem as part of a you know and so that like so that and and especially now with with um the integration of technology into our lives like the there's a lot of like information that is not stored in my head that I still kind of think of as like part of my history and identity and like personhood that's like now in a computer. And, you know, I don't, you know, the, all the music I've ever listened to is like, has not, has an, you know, influence on me. And like, that's, but that's not, I can't just off the head, you know, recall all of that. Right. So it's, right. you know, or like every, thing that i've ever made or every like conversation that i've had with people in the past that's like now sitting you know in like a text message log and so there's this so that this idea of like a self and identity is kind of this like nebulous concept that we apply to stuff and extends kind of beyond the physical body in that sense and you can kind of take that to meaning like my influence on other people is also part of me uh, that like other people's, you know, internal concept of who I am and like what my relationship to them is, is also sort of a part of my identity. So, mm. and then if I'm gone, then like elements of me survive and the people that I've interacted with people whose lives I've, I've impacted in one way or another, positive mm. or negative. And so I kind of view things a few things like that um, from this like kind of organizational standpoint. Mm. Um, so, and I, I leave some room in there for the unknown. processes that I don't have. Yeah. There, I don't know how they work. Like that humanity as overall doesn't know how they work. Like there's, but I, I kind of, I want to see some evidence for a lot of, right. for, for things like, and I try, and that, that's something that, like, um, it took a little bit of getting used to, like, being introduced into, like, the festival scene and, like, the, the kind of, like, the people that you're going to encounter there, the conversations that you're going to have there, like, are, I can't, you know, my my first reaction was, like, very kind of, like, cynical and, like, ah, oh, like these people talking about Crystals, fucking astrology. Uh... And we're like, yeah, it's, like, cool. But, like, it means something to them. Like, it has some important yeah right like sure yeah. i don't but like your excitement about your crystals like doesn't really cause problems for for me unless it does right. you know but yeah, like yeah. in which case that then it can become a thing we can fight but like you know um but yeah, yeah I'm, not, like, I'm not pushing on you my crystal agenda right. and making it a dogmatic black and white thing that if you don't follow yeah. it you're gonna go to hell yeah so i I've been, I've kind of gone through this process over the last like decade of like getting more okay with like just other people have views of the world that are radically different from mine, um, often very similar, but like have some key differences or like, uh, and there are things that I don't really think of as being like real in a, right, in yeah. a, science like actual physical reality kind of way but like mm -hmm. you know and so a lot of like the conversations but like but those things may still be a metaphor for something that that is real sure. and so sure. something that like or it might you know, be real if, in a way that we don't understand right, right. like multi-dimensional right. or quantum that yeah we have like a grasp of like, like we were talking about the 4d before like we have a way yeah. to visualize it we have a way to even quantum you can test it right in some degree varying degrees but what is actually happening, what is really behind it, and also, like, what are the implications, right? Like, because it, it's really endless in that sense. I think that what you're saying is very, um, you're almost, I, I don't want to push anything on you, but you're almost, mm. like, the, the way that you're viewing things is in a spiritual way. Does that make sense? Like, spiritual is a it's, very, yeah. like, silly, it's a silly word. It's a silly word. Well, it can, but, yeah, it can mean a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah. Just just the fact that you're accepting to other people's ideas and 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 ways of thinking, and that yeah. you're looking at it and saying, "Well, I'm not really sure. I don't know." That already yeah. in itself allows you to, in my opinion, view the world in a much more broader sense than, you know, 
um, uh, uh, what's it called? Um, uh, not agnosticism, but um, atheism is become yeah. a religion in itself, right? Like oh, sure. the idea, yeah. the idea of dogmatic beliefs in unbelief is so yeah. weird to me that yeah. it's like you're just limiting yourself in that sense, right? Which is like kind of almost counterintuitive to science because science is never concurrent. It's right. like the whole idea of it is that it's true until proven otherwise. So you're always leaving yes. the idea yeah. of things to change. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that that's a really beautiful way of looking at the world and it, it, it allows you to accept and um, hear and learn, right? Without uh, being concrete in your ideas. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's, I, you know, so like you're, you're talking earlier about like your experience with like the horse riding, like, do I, do I personally think that like, there's like telepathic communication between you and the horse? Like probably not, right. but maybe, hey, I don't I'll know, fight probably, you, bro. probably not, but, <laughs> but like that is, there's probably, you know, there's probably like a thousand little like miniature movements of your, of your shifting of your weight in right. subtle ways. And like that has you've developed a language of that right. communicating with this other being that knows that right. like when it feels this, you know, a little bit of a shift on one of its shoulders, that then means it, that you're like kind of going in that direction or like going. And it could be, like that, it could be yeah. even more, it could be even more, um, not subtle, but it could be even more esoteric than that. Like of, of like the horse has a different way of perceiving reality than we do. Right. Yeah. And we will never yeah. know how the horse perceives reality. And maybe I'm not saying that the horse sees telepathic imagery, but it could be that, like you said, like that small, minute thing that is uh, translated as like a physical thing in the horse's mind is translated as like a very big thing, right? And that's yeah. kind of like, but I feel like that's like the macro, the micro of the macro, right? Like everything in the universe is kind of operating on that sense of like, we can understand it to the only degree, the degrees of the three dimensions and five senses that we have. And anything outside yeah. of that is speculation, is belief, is theory right yeah and I, I think that like i think it is likely that basically everything could technically be quantified um but like i mean it's it's and it's a similar thing with like a lot of the kind of ai development of like you know our arguments over the years about like you know is it possible for like a computer to like have sentience like consciousness you yeah. know per personally i think you could you know you could model down to the atom like the contents of an organic brain like i think it would effectively be the same thing but right. it's really really complicated there are so many parts there are so many like and so much of what we think of as like you know thought or behavior or identity right is like these abstract patterns of of emergent behavior right, that were right, like right. that like come out of billions of tiny little things like you know do you know following simple rules and like that's sure. but like we think of that as like a person having a thought and not right. like a billion little you know synapses electrical signals like yeah. yeah so and also like you you also add to that the idea of like okay thought and emotions and consciousness are, they're all in the same spectrum, but they're very, very different yeah. from each other, right? Like, yeah. Um, and like, and then you add into like the idea of like psychedelic experience, or or even just like you know altered states of reality. Like, you know, how can you quantify a physical reality? Like, how can you quantify it if it's something so individualistic, so um, you know, personal? And then add to that like near death experiences, people going yeah. coming back and going forward, and like, you know, um, add into that all like the story of like you know past lives and what we understand now about quantum theory kind of makes sense for past lives in a way of like entanglement theory and kind of things happening at once in multi-dimensions but there's endless dimensions that are happening all that the same like you know obviously i'm yeah. not anywhere near understanding this on a scientific level but i'm just saying trying to say of the sense of like what like quantifying consciousness yeah i'm sure that like anything, it can be quantified, but is it even possible? Like, will it even happen in our iteration of reality? Like, you know, maybe yeah. it's something that 
you can quantify thoughts, right? We already have ChatGPT, right? It's almost in a way kind of conversa- conversing with you at a very high level, yeah. but is it having its own thoughts? And what is having its own thoughts? Like, what do do I have my own thoughts, right? Am I just pulling right. in from like a yeah. collective conscious cloud or is it from a different dimension or, you know, so it's like so... But I, but I love that. I love that there isn't an answer to that. I love that yeah. you have your way of thinking about it and I have my way of thinking about it. And as long as we don't like, you know, kill each other over it, I think that it's a great thing to have different things. And that's how we figure things out, right? Yeah. And that's, I mean, any, any view of any, anybody that's like certain that they know how things are is I mean, probably an inherently dangerous person, but um, I mean, that's 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 the root of like so much of humanity's problems are like yeah. s- people that are certain about things being one way and yeah. enforcing that on the world around them. Of course, of course, of course. And it always comes down to uh, that certain thing is always like an us versus them situation of yeah. like, well, I know the answer to everything. And if you don't subscribe to it, then not only are you wrong, you're dangerous, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's like, you're right. It's like, it's not even about religion really at this point. It's more of like, like you said, like being so certain about something in such a dogmatic and black and white way that you're inherently creating an other from anybody who disagrees with you. Um, and then just enforcing that other and, you know, killing that yeah. other uh, you know, uh, whatever, all the fascist leaders and dictators kind of, that's their, that's their, uh, forte, you know, yeah. uh, we know how yep. it works and you don't believe in it and therefore you're the wrong person. And that's kind of like, yep. you know, what we're living through now with so many political and, you know, um, atrocities and, and, and really yes. fucked up shit that's happening throughout the world. It always comes down to an us versus them. And to me, yeah. When it comes down to an us versus them, it's clear to me that it's being manipulated because, like, I don't think that yeah. there is such a thing as an us versus them, at least in the context of like being right or wrong. I mean, there is like an yeah. us versus them, right? In like culture or identity, and uh, maybe like, you know, um, uh, geography, and maybe like, you know, in terms of like maybe even, I mean, maybe even, you know, lineages and things like that and past things, but. It's a, on a much more like conceptual level because really like we're all the same and we all come from the same place, etc. So anytime there's an us versus them conversation, it's always clear to me that it's a propaganda or it's a mind control yes. or it's a, you know, fascistic, uh, you know, uh, way of approaching things. So, yeah, I mean, it's a it's a real good way to manipulate people because it ties into something that's like really kind of fundamental to us of like i mean tribalism is is built into our genetics like it, yeah. it, and it's send and like civilization is or at least should be us like attempting to counteract that it uh, yeah it, well i feel like it probably was right like you know uh hunter gatherer agriculture revolution industrial revolution like i think if you were in those moments Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously they, they occurred over like thousands of years, but if you were like involved in those moments, I think that that on the surface or at least maybe in the in the vicinity, it looked as like a progress, a progress of like bettering humanity, making it better progression, progression. And like that's also part of our inherent uh, genetics, I think, is um, evolution. Right. It's making things better and going forward. But then when you look at it at like a retrospect or something, it's like those things kind of pulled us so far away from our core. Right. Like, yeah, agriculture was great. It allowed us to, you know, make civilization and allowed yeah. us to like control our environment. But it also made us fuck up the environment and create us versus them. Right. And industrial revolution, yeah. it's great. We have computers. We can do uh, art, but also like, you know, military industrial complex and, yes. you know, destroying the environment. So it's like, and I bet that the same things probably on a much more esoteric level happened during, you know, hunter gatherers and like the evolution of man from monkey. But like, you know, over the course of a long, 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 long time, um, it just, like you said, like, it's so interesting, like as a civilization, we're trying to make things better, right? We're trying to understand each other and, and our uh, differences and make things better. But, some 
fuckers like mess it up for everybody. You know, some fucking yes. asshole at some point is like, yeah, I'm going to make 500 sheep and I'm going to treat them like shit because it's cheaper yeah. or whatever, you know, like just example. Yeah. A, you know, just like a like a hey, guys, what if we just made everything kind of worse? How about that? Like, what if we added some stuff? Like, let's like make those people suffer so that like yeah. we can get, you know, I don't know, cheap fruit, Ooh. like. Yeah, a cheaper. Yeah, cheaper thing. What do you uh, as a as a as a as a send off? Maybe trying in a in a positive way. What do you think? Your what do you think a good solution to this is? What do I think a good solution is to like all of the core problems of humanity? <laughs> um, yeah. Ray TK. <laughs> no, yes. I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> um, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I could come up with something about you know replacing us with AI or something. But Ooh. um, which in my youth I I. I absolutely would have been a proponent of um until i realized that it's going to be built by people and built by shitty people yeah Um, yeah 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 yeah, but yeah i mean i think like understanding is kind of the key thing is kind of like the key thing and like it's Mm. real it's real it's a lot easier to like make someone suffer if they're far away and you're not air and you're not and you have no idea what their experience is and Mm -hmm. just being able to understand how different like other people's circumstances and and view of the world can be from your own like is i mean that's that's critical to being able to live with each other and you know knowing that like I don't know, pe- different different people's environments have different needs. And like the, the things that say, may seem reasonable to me where I am may not be reasonable to somebody else in different circumstances. Like, mm-hmm. but if I'm not even really thinking about that fact, then I'm just going to assume that what I, that what's good for me is what is, you know, good for everybody. So like understanding and uh, in uh, accepting like the range of different experiences, I think is the only way that we can really survive. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that the core of that would be empathy, you know, yes. maybe like a very base level empathy. The moment you have yep. empathy for yourself and the moment you have empathy for others, then it's not mm-hmm. hard to listen. It's not hard to understand. And maybe understand's a big word. Like I don't have to understand the person far away. I just have to listen. I just have to yeah. be empathetic to their reality and be yes. empathetic that my reality is not everybody's. Um, yes. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think that, I hope that, I pray that, um, that we will all understand that at some point. And, you know, I don't want to sound like pretentious or anything, but I feel like it's easy. I feel like being empathetic is inherent in humans unless you know, you're a psychotic or you have, um, some imbalance and, you know, you know, uh, you, thankfully we live in a world where you can actually deal with that and and actually focus on it and and make it better. But it's such a small thing. Like if, if each person individually looks at themselves with empathy, you're going to automatically look at others with empathy and that's going to spread out. And, you know, I don't think that we have we can't solve big world problems, but we can solve the problems with each other and with our communities, with our spouses, with our friends, with our kids, with our, you know, people around us. And that spreads out, you know, just like, just yeah. like the dictator starts in a room with 30 people manipulating them and propagandizing them and spreads yep. out his hatred. The same thing is true to, uh, you know, and, and we don't have to use any like pretentious things. The same thing is true with core empathy. You know, mm-hmm. it doesn't have to be altruistic. It doesn't have to be peace and love and whatever the fuck. I mean, that's how I subscribe to it, but it doesn't have to be that. It could just be a core thing of just like, I love myself. I love you. Done. Done. If you practice that times 8 billion, we're yeah. good. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, that that kind of... Things that are that seem like a simple shift, uh, especially like after the fact or from outside, like can take a no, lot to to get you there. I mean, to get yeah. can you know somebody's 
you know, because you're coming up against like culture and, you know, thousands of years of history and, you know, experiences that people have had and traumas that people have experienced and traumas that people Fear, have seen other people experience. Pain. And, yeah. Yeah. Of course. But, but so I think ultimately the solution is going to be, is going to seem simple afterwards, but right. getting there will be hard. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like we kind of, we know it, right? In, yes. And maybe we know it what isn't, we need to do. We know what we need just to do. Not, right. We just have to get ourselves to do it. We'll scale it up and, you know, defeat the uh, antithesis of, excuse me, of those kind of things with the dictators and fascists and whatever. Um, right. And, but even, you know, even then, are, like, that's that's making use of a an us versus them mentality, right? True. So, like, the tools that we have to work with to get there are tools of, like, violence and, like, you know, inequality. And, you know, that's trying to build a, like, peaceful, equal civilization using those tools is going to be real hard. Yeah. But oh, it's also, it's super hope, counter Hopefully not impossible. Well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I have this conversation a lot, and we can, we can end soon, but I have this conversation a lot with people, um where I'm from, you know, about uh, necessary evils or kind of like the idea of war leading to peace. And yes, I find it very easy to argue against it because I just understand inside of me that it's wrong. But on a very like objective level, it's hard to argue. It's hard to argue with those kind of things. And I think that a lot of it is obviously misinformation. It's who writes mm -hmm. history. It's how we view these things. It's, you know, leaving out things and, um, you know, focusing on very specific things. And I think that a very big part of looking back at our history and learning from the mistakes is being able to have that access to, quote unquote, clean information or, quote unquote, um, you know, objective information that's yeah. not... Yeah. Uh, edited or, you know, yeah. re redacted. Um, yeah. You know, and I think the more and more, you know, it's kind of like conspiracy theory, you know, what is conspiracy theory? It's conspiracy until it's proven and then it's fact, right? And then it's like, well, yeah. was the idea a conspiracy or was that, you know, was the conspiracy that the thing was a conspiracy, you know? Um, yeah. It's just very interesting, like how information is changing and how like since the advent of the Internet and since the advent of, uh, you know, streaming information and stream live streaming atrocities, how yeah. how the, the the conversation has changed. And it's kind of scary because at the same time that we have access to all this information, we also have now access to well, not we, but the bad people have access to tools of manipulation and propaganda that far you know, far out yes. reach what we even could imagine, which is why yes. we're in such a situation. I think that there will be yep. some sort of convergence, some sort of, you know, um, uh, what's the word in, in science where there's like a, a big uh, thing that happens, a, um, uh, 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 like a Skynet happening is what is it called? Like a singularity a singularity. There'll be a singularity yeah. with information where it's like, you can't, you look at information, like information just comes in. There's no like, Real information, not in real information. It's just, this is information, it's objective, and nobody's editing it, nobody's redacting it. I think that that will hopefully open up a lot of, um, you know, peaceful times for us. Yeah, but it's, whatever that is, is going to be built by people. Right. It's so true. So we got to make those, those incremental steps towards, like, being better, and each generation hopefully being better than the one before in, in some way or another yeah. but yeah well with that Ooh. i think it was a, a semi-positive note obviously um you yeah. know uh, these kind of things are going to be hard to always end in a positive note, yeah but um ray tk uh ray ray tk april um, yeah. check out tommy's stuff thank you so 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 much for um conversing with me tommy and showing your processes it's uh really awesome you're a super cool dude and i'm happy to thank be you. your friend and uh happy to have this time spent with you thank you for having me on this has been really interesting absolutely epic so much fun having tommy on go check out ray tk if it's still april 2024 or maybe even 2025 go check out ray tk april 
take part in the challenge. Those are always really inspiring. Um, thank you so much to Mantis Mash for letting us use his music in the intro and outro. Next week, we have a very special guest. He's a seagull? Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. See you next week.